I want to show you something that's been going on in the country for a while. Uh, from 1913 on, and we're going to start with 1913 for a very interesting reason. Can 1913, okay, uh, if you had a if you had a house in 1913, let's say you had a house here. This is the year. All right, I'm going to even try another marker here. See if we can get a darker marker. Uh, the house, the average house in the United States, sold for about uh, about a thousand dollars. Okay, so. Uh, about a thousand dollars. Yeah, that's a little better, isn't it? Okay. And if you had a loaf of bread, if you bought, bought a loaf of bread in the back in 1913, it, it cost a penny. And uh, if you're into Mother Goose and all the rhymes, remember one a penny, two a penny, hot cross buns, <laughs> all that stuff. Okay. You have to excuse me. I'm, I'm a grandfather, so I get into this. All right. <clears throat> but it's it's fun to see how how things change here, uh, because we're going to show you that there's a pattern. If we go to school, uh, we, get, we get in history what's called existentialism. And I don't know if you know what existentialism means, but it means that there isn't any reason for anything. It just exists. <laughs> if, you get, if you really believe that, you, get, you can become a teacher. <laughs> All right, we're going to show you the things, that things don't just exist, that they are caused. And uh, as the saying goes, yes, Virginia, there is a plan. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> And uh, you're going to be amazed at this plan, I think, when you see it, because it's affecting all of us, and yet we don't realize what it is. It's, a, it's sort of like we're in a riptide. We swim in, and then every Friday we swim back out, you know, and the paycheck comes in, we lose it all again, and we just live paycheck to paycheck. And the other six days of the week we're trying to swim in, and payday we swim back out. Okay. All right. Now, what we have here is a dollar, then, in, back in 1913 was worth a dollar. And uh, income tax in 1913. Does anybody happen to know right offhand what the income tax was in 1913? Zero. Zero. Right. Isn't that interesting? There was no income tax, was there? All right. Now, we're starting with 1913 because we're going to again and again and again come back to this because we're going to demonstrate, I think, before the, uh, the meeting is over here, that the United States was a different country after 1913. It had different management. It had different goals. It had a different operation. We are actually witnessing the advent of two Americas, if you will, all right? Uh, and there are two Americas existing right now, side by side. Now, these, you may sound like, well, <laughs> which way is out, okay? Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you haven't heard anything like this, okay? But this is actually happening. Give, us, give, us, give me just a moment to demonstrate this, but there's two things going on here that we don't understand. And when we understand it, then it makes sense and you can cope and you can make all the money you want to make and you don't have to lose any in taxes and stuff like that if you don't want to. Now, if you want to pay tax, but, you know, that's fine. All right. Uh, in 1913, we had a, an organization uh, start in our country called a central bank. We're going to be going into a central bank and what a central bank is because this is not taught in history. We're taught in history, you know, existentialism, the, the banks just come and go, there's no reason. Well, <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> nothing that, you, nothing that, I, that we're going to be learning today did I learn in school. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is interesting stuff. It's all in the school of hard knocks afterwards that we, we learned this, all right? They, the boys in the bank, the, 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 com, the uh, central bank, started printing money at a rate of 7.12%. Okay? 7.12% is what normally is known as the rule of seven, because if you print money at a rate of 7.12% and it's compound interest, I mean, every 10 years, the money supply doubles, all right? Now, the problem with that is, is that the base of the wealth doesn't double. So we're talking about the money supply doubles in relationship to the amounts of goods and services available, if you will. All right? In other words, there's twice as much money to buy the same commodity. All right? This is referred to as M1, M2, M1, M2, so forth and so on. We want the M numbers up here, okay, because we're going to talk about this, because these guys all baffle you with all these M numbers, all right? Now, money is printed here, okay? So that means that here's the year over here. Okay, and every 10 years, this money doubles. Okay, now, you may say, well, so what? Well, we have just described inflation, okay? Because by 1923, the money supply in the United States had doubled. There was twice as much money in 1923 as there was in 1913, but there wasn't any, any more base to it. In other words, it was like just adding water to the soup. Pretty soon, the soup doesn't taste quite the same, does it, all right? So now, uh, what do you suppose, having never maybe been to Stanford or anything like this, okay, 
what do you suppose happened to prices? Okay, but you're familiar with Stanford. It's the school up the coast. <laughs> they used to call the football team the Big Red Machine. Of course, now that's what we call the faculty. Okay, now, so what happens here, you see, is that having, if you had gone to a business school up there, uh, okay, they would teach you what inflation is. By the time you get out, it takes you about two hours to describe inflation. Okay, and when you get through, you realize the guy hasn't, doesn't really know what it is, okay? All right, what causes inflation is an increase in the supply of money. And you can extend that to credit, if you will, okay? To a certain extent, credit can be money. But it's, and I'm getting this right out of Webster's Ninth Collegiate Dictionary. This is not like some esoteric tome that I'm reading. <laughs> this is the English definition of inflation. It's an increase in the supply of money. Okay? All right, so if money is, if there's twice as much money in existence, what do you suppose would happen to the price of the house? Anybody want to take a wild guess? Doubles. Well, you guys aren't very sophisticated. That's right, it doubles, you see. It doubles, okay? It would take four years of, of higher education to confuse that. Okay? All right? Okay? It's not easy to confuse this. It takes quite some time. Okay? And uh, you get degrees in it. All right, now, what do you suppose would happen to the loaf of bread? Two cents. Okay, you were moving along here. This is great, sharp crowd, okay? I, I take back everything I heard about LA. Okay, now, all right, now. <laughs> all right, dollars. Okay, what was the dollar worth? Right, see, isn't this fun, see? Oh boy, now, there was an income tax because the, the law said in, in the 16th Amendment, we're gonna get into the 16th Amendment because in the 16th Amendment never passed. The 16th uh, the Amendment was only ratified by four states. It wasn't ratified by two-thirds of the states which required for an amendment, okay? There are some books on the subject which uh, we'll get to later on. We're going to talk about books later on because you're pretty, hey, you're going to hear some pretty bizarre stuff from me, and I would just want to be able to document it, okay? <clears throat> we were going to now steal from the rich and give to the poor. Is this a good deal or what? <laughs> that means for you to collect something, you didn't have to do anything. Is this great? You see how that works? See? And somebody who does produce something now is now stolen from. I mean, is it, this, hey, this is a great system, isn't it? And uh, they called it, I think there was a fellow by the name of Karl Marx, he was a show business guy that they put on the name of a book years ago. And uh, after the, 20 years after the book was written, his name was added to it to distract from who really wrote the book. We'll get into that in history. He said that he, uh, the, the, this uh, garbage, or whatever you want to call it, uh, <laughs> yeah, is that uh, this is called from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Isn't that interesting? So if you have an ability to pay, you pay. And if you have a need, you receive. Is this great? This has built the tremendous system that we see in Russia today. <laughs> After 80 years, they cannot produce a paper clip. Okay, why? Because, let's just take for an example, okay, you, you get a plot of land over there, and you go out and you say, well, this is exciting, and they give you a tractor and all this because it's a state farm, isn't it? Yeah, no pun on the insurance company. Okay, what happens here is that, uh, that uh, so you go out every morning at 5 o'clock and you, and you farm this land, okay? And boy, you have a great harvest. Well, meanwhile, this dodo that lives next to you sleeps till noon every day. <laughs> well, you know, he's not too excited about it. Now, what happens at harvest time? Uh, he, you take your wheat into the government town and the, and the government gives you back equal amounts. I mean, because you're equal now, right? Isn't that interesting? So you, you make an interesting observation that on the day of harvest, he gets as much as you get. Get it? This is equality. Why, isn't this nice? Okay, the only question I have is, what time do you get up next year? <laughs> yeah. See, who produces the wheat? Nobody. Isn't that interesting? We have now described socialism. <laughs> that takes about three years in the government school. Okay, now, so what are we learning here? Okay, we're learning that the information we have is pretty much bunko, isn't it? We don't know why we're broke. We don't know what's wrong with the country. We don't know why we can't keep what we earn. We don't know all these things, you see. And after I submit after the seminar today, we will. <laughs> you may be mad, but you'll know it. <laughs> okay. Okay, now, and this is called, by the way, this is called M1. Because that was the original supply of money. Okay. That's our first problem is that the board doesn't erase. Okay. <laughs> so we'll just use different colors as we go over it again and again, okay? <laughs> all right, now. <laughs> all right, this is known as M2. Why is this known as M2? Because there's twice as much money. It's money too, I guess. You know, I took 
years of this economic stuff. And if you ever wrote anything intelligent on a test, of course, you'd flunk this, the test. So you didn't put anything down that made any sense. OK, that's economics, OK? Now, all right, we're in for another big surprise. What do you suppose happened in 1933? Moving right along, uh, we now find that the boys keep printing the money here. And there may be some girls involved. I'm not sure. All right, and we have $4,000 for a house. We have four cents for a loaf of bread. We have 25 cents for a worth of a dollar. We have a 1% income tax. Now, isn't that interesting? If you worked and worked and worked, and you finally doubled your income, so you could stay even where you were the last 10 years, your taxes doubled. <laughs> this is called surprise. <laughs> Get it? <laughs> it's called, you have arrived, chop. OK, now, OK, this is called M3, because the money supply doubled again. It's not called M4. It's called M3. Yeah, it takes many years to get this remembered. <clears throat> OK? Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Now, let's take a look at 1943. In 1943, we have an $8,000 house. We've got an $0.08 loaf of bread. We've got a $0.12 dollar. We've got a 2% income tax. We've got M4. Hmm. All right, we'll try another one. OK, 1953 rolls along. You won't guess what happens in 1950, or maybe you will. <laughs> $16,000 house, 16 cent loaf of bread, 6 cent dollar, 4% income tax, M5. Moving right along, we now come to 1963. It takes a little while to understand history. All right, $32,000 for a house, 32 cents for a loaf of bread, 3 cents for a dollar, 8% income tax, M6. I'm going to show you what happens at M10. OK? At M10, something magical happens. And I'll explain that in just a minute. OK, 1973, we have a $64,000 house, a 64 cent loaf of bread, a dollar worth two cents, and a 16% income tax, we have M7. Moving right along, we come to 1983. We have a $128,000 house. We've got a $1.28 loaf of bread. We've got a dollar worth one cent. It takes 100 times more today to buy something than your grandfather paid in 1913. Plus, you're going to lose 32% in the taxes, which he didn't. <laughs> you understand that why your grandpa had the farm and you don't, right? I mean, this is understandable. OK, he was much better off. OK, M8. OK, moving right along, we come to 1993. And since this is going to be on a videotape, we won't tell you what year this is. We'll just keep going. <laughs> because see, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> this thing will be just as correct 20 years from now as it was today. OK, we've got, uh, oh, well, golly, 128, what have we got there? $256,000 for a house, a $2.56 loaf of bread, a dollar worth one half of one cent, and a 64% income tax. And we have M9. Isn't this exciting? All right, moving along to M10. We have the year 2003, $512,000 for a house, $5.12 for a loaf of bread, a dollar worth one-tenth of one cent, and 128% income tax in M10. We have arrived. How would you pay 128% income tax? And I'll give you the answer. It, you'd have to sell everything you own and borrow money. And you would say, well, who would do that? And I would tell you right now, American farmers all do that. Isn't that interesting? Anybody who has property does that. Because the property, the ownership of the property is a burden. OK? All right. The ownership of anything is a burden. OK, what happened here? Why? What happened? Let's take a look. Let's go back to 1776. We go back to 1776, and the average house was $1,000. And again, we're going to give you some books and documentation. The loaf of bread was a penny. OK? The dollar was a dollar. The income tax was zero, OK, and we still had M1, OK? Now, 137 years go by, OK? All these years go by. And what do we have? Why? We have no inflation, do we? Now, what do we hear when we go to school? Well, inflation has always been with us. Inflation is a perennial problem. Whoops, not for America. Not for the first 137 years, was it? And we've always had taxes. Well, not for the first 130 years we didn't have these taxes. By the way, you know, Will Rogers says there is a difference between death and taxes. Did you know that? He said that death doesn't get worse every time Congress meets. OK, but anyway, so what we, have, what we have here, you see, is that, 
Okay. <laughs> okay. As you see, that basically, we have 137 years here where there wasn't any income tax or any inflation. Isn't that interesting? We didn't hear this in school, did we? We didn't, we didn't hear that there was a big difference between 1776 to 1913 and 1913. We didn't hear this in economics. We didn't get this in history, did we? A few things kind of left out of the school system, isn't it, see? <laughs> well, suppose I went to a school and I taught this. <laughs> How long do you think I'd be on the faculty, see? See, not very long. Probably until about the college president heard I was teaching something like this, because this is not to be taught on a college campus, because this does not produce adjustment, you see. And that's what they're after with the kiddies is adjustment. Isn't this interesting? It's not necessary that Johnny learns to read, write, or spell. It's necessary that he's adjusted. <laughs> we have now just discussed higher learning. <laughs> see, actually, higher learning is dangerous, so you don't get any of it. <laughs> you just get more years in school. <laughs> It's devoid of higher learning, isn't it? All right? Because you'd be all upset if you learned something happened in 1913 that wasn't going on before, wouldn't you? And that wouldn't produce adjustment, you see. So therefore, the government must run all the schools to make sure that this adjustment is induced. All right, let's take a look at this. Hmm, okay. Well, you know, you say, well, things are different now. You know, it's not as simple, and, you know, so forth and so on. You don't want any of these simplistic answers and, you know, all this garbage that explains why people can't explain what they learned when they went to school. <laughs> it's complicated, okay? <laughs> all right, <clears throat> let's take a look at this. What happened in the country from 1776 to 1913? Was this good for the country or was it bad for the country? So let's just analyze this for a minute, okay? What was the impact of no taxes, no income taxes, and uh, no property taxes, well, a little bit of property taxes, but certainly uh, no inheritance taxes on the country, where people could actually acquire property and keep it. Was this good or was it bad? Was this an, a positive incentive or was it a negative incentive? See, so forth and so on. So let's just take a, a quick look back through history, and we'll take a look and say, well, history started, I think, about the year, uh, what was it, 3000 BC or something? It was the first time it was Moses wrote the first five books of the, of the Bible, or the Pentateuch, they call it. And from the Garden of Eden, which is about 3,000 years B.C., something like that, okay, until America was started, 1776 A.D., here, okay, uh, what do we have? Approximately 5,000 years, something like that. And then we have a little period of time after this, okay, from to 1913. Okay, a little, little period of time. Okay, now... From this period of time to this period of time, what happened? If Adam and Eve wanted to go somewhere, they'd probably ride a horse, don't you imagine? Now, if, if uh, George Washington wanted to go up to, to Philadelphia to the Con Continental Convention and he left Mount Vernon down in Virginia, how do you suppose he would travel? He'd ride a horse, wouldn't he? So notice what we have. 5,000 years goes by, people are riding horses. That's interesting. Not a whole lot of progress, is there? Okay, let's go back, we'll look at the Bible here, we'll go back into Gideon and the Valley of Midianites. Remember he was up there and he had all these Midianites down the valley and they signaled to him and they waved lanterns. This was like about three, this was about 2,000 years B.C. This was back in the book of Judges, okay? Now, notice if you wanted to send a message at night, 4,000 years ago, <laughs> you waved a lantern, didn't you? Isn't that interesting? Now, question, here's the biggie. When Paul Revere wanted to notify us that the British were coming just 150, 200 years ago, how was he able to signal that? He put a lantern in the belfry, didn't he? Isn't that interesting? 4,000 years later, guys are waving lanterns. Hi, George. Hi, Sam. How are you? See? Good. Well, time to go. See? Waving lanterns. Not a whole lot of progress, was there? Why? Because if anybody invented something, it would be taken away from him and used against him. That is called socialism. That's called from each according to his ability to each according to his need. So no, everybody make sure he doesn't have any ability. <laughs> We've now described America's welfare program. If you work, you lose. If you produce anything, out. Only if you are a non-productive, unmarried person bearing children are you eligible for these rewards. Now, what's happening to the homes in America as a result of this? Is this good for America or bad for America? What are we getting? We get what we pay for. Have you ever noticed that? If we want to pay for licentiousness, we want to pay for no production, you simply buy it. And it happens. And what is our money going for? Something that's good for the country or bad for the country? You see. 
Isn't that interesting? We haven't got to wars yet. We'll get to that. Wars are even more interesting because that kills the people quicker. <coughs> Sometimes you can't wait for a generation. <laughs> you have to do it right away. The money buys that. Okay, now notice what we have here. During this period of time, what happened in the United States? Well, let's see. Uh, we had Robert uh, Fulton comes along. He invents a steamboat. The newspapers didn't like it. The newspapers don't like much. They're still run by the English bank. We'll get to that later. And they called it Fulton's Folly and so forth. But he made the equivalent of today millions of dollars, and he kept it. No tax. Well, this, this got to be exciting, wasn't it? Because it turns out that if you could build something that someone else benefited from and they would buy it, you would make a shh, quiet profit. <laughs> we don't say those words around USC, do we? Profit. Oh, very bad, greedy, filthy. You see all these things that are attached to profit? Profit is what caused the progress. Guys could keep what they earn. Isn't that exciting? Hey, the first time in history this ever happened. And no nation on earth had ever developed where the people could keep what they earned. You always had this problem of having sharecropping and so forth. That's where a lot of your wages go to the Lord of the manor. You recognize it today. It's called withholding. Okay, you see? And see, we have these new names for old slavery. You see? And the result is we produce nothing. How many guys do you know don't want to work extra overtime or don't want to get any more money? It's just it's a big burden. Because now they lose it. Why work for something that they can't keep? You see the negative impact here of this stuff. Okay? Now, all right, so we find here some interesting stuff. Uh, we have Eli Whitney comes along. He invents a cotton gin. All the cotton mills and the presses in Europe collapsed. You know what England did? They passed a law that the cotton gin was illegal in England. Boy, that would stop it, wouldn't it? The whole garment industry in England totally collapsed. <laughs> Nobody produced anything anymore. It was dead in a doornail. It was all produced from New York. Isn't that interesting? It still is. See, you can't make a law that, out, that outdoes economics. I mean, economics is the ultimate law. We're going to talk about this today. Economics is the law of, 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 why people, of, of motivation, why people do things. All right. Uh, what somebody once said that the pen is mightier than the sword, uh, but the purse always buys the pen. <laughs> <laughs> Stay with the purse. <laughs> this happened in the case of Karl Marx, where the Bank of England actually bought his pen. He's buried in England, London, of course, where his, where his employers were. He never went to Russia. Isn't that interesting? Okay. All right. The purse buys the pen. Let's remember that. All right. The most important thing is who pays for it, because who pays for it gets what he pays for it. Well, we find that uh, Cyrus McCormick comes along, he invents a reaper, makes what's equivalent a million dollars today, keeps it. And uh, other guys are noticing this. Matter of fact, people are coming from Europe now because this is now called the, the New World, the land of the free, the home of the brave, the melting pot, if you will. People are saving up their money in Scandinavia and every place else. To, their big dream is to come to America. You see, why? Because they keep what they earn. Well, uh, a little while later, Samuel Morse invents a telegraph, keeps all the money. Matter of fact, he, he bought all the, much of the land up around Monterey, up the coast in there, all the canneries and so forth, and his posterity still owns that. He passed it on down to his grandchildren, his children's children, and so forth, and they still own that. They still have it in the family, you see, because he invented a telegraph. Isn't that interesting? A few other things, too. Well, uh, we find that a guy came along by the name of Alexander Bell, and he invents a telephone. Isn't this interesting? He keeps the money. Well, another fellow comes along by the name of Marconi. Now, Marconi actually invented the radio in, in Italy. He didn't dare introduce it there because the government would take it away from it. It'd be a government radio. So he went to England, and he tried to introduce it in England, and they put him in, in a, a mental institution. They put him in a... They put him in, and meanwhile, the boys in the bank got his invention, and 20 years before he was able to get to America and release the invention, they were talking back and forth between London and New York. Isn't that interesting? With his radio. But nevertheless, he was able to get out of the funny farm and come over to America where he introduced it and made millions of dollars as a result of inventing the radio. He, never, he didn't dare introduce this, uh, this invention. Any other country, it would be taken away from him. It would be stolen. That's why in the first 5,000 years, nobody invented a radio. It's really not hard to figure that out, is it? If you've been in the Army, you understand how that works. <laughs> Anybody who, who produces anything in the Army is taken in and given what they call a GI shower. <laughs> The other guys don't like it when you do things that make them look bad. You stand in the middle of the third row, you never volunteer for anything, you wear the same suit, and you don't look any different and you don't do any differently. You got that? 
because the next shower is with Y. You see, and you can take care of guys that produce things. Because the peer pressure not to produce is extremely high, you see, if that information is used against the other people. In other words, if you peel potatoes twice as, twice as fast as the norm, <laughs> the next guy has to peel potatoes faster. That is a threat to him. And they'll take care of you. There's ways to do that. Sometimes it's called missing in action. <laughs> but you will not peel twice as fast, got it? Under no condition will that ever happen. You see, any progress is penalized. And as a result, nobody produces anything. It's pretty simple to figure out, isn't it? All right, uh, a fellow comes along by the name of uh, Thomas Edison. He invents some electric lights and recorded sound and so forth and so on. Makes millions of dollars. He keeps it all. Can you imagine this? These guys kept it. Wasn't that greedy? It's hard to believe. All these inventions were made by these greedy people, isn't it? <laughs> all right. Uh, and then now you got the Wright brothers come along, they invent some airplanes, they fly around, keep the money, this is interesting. Henry Ford comes along, introduces the mass production of automobiles. People are driving, there aren't even any roads. Henry's driving all over in cow trails. The model T's this high off the ground so they can go through the mud. Only in America. Notice these things didn't come from any other place. Oh, there was a spin-off and France could copy us after we had the airplane, then they could copy the airplane. And after we, after we had the mass production automobile, then they could copy that. You see, notice the most advanced technological uh, country today. And I, I come from up in Silicon Valley, up there in San Jose area. And it's really interesting because we hear about the, oh, the Japanese and the Germans and all the Koreans and all these guys that are, that are you know, passing us in the production of stuff. But you see, they're not passing us in the development of things. The only thing that they can produce is a copy of what we invented last Friday. You notice that? It's really fascinating. But because there's still enough private enterprise available here that it, it rewards innovation, and it doesn't exist in the other countries. All, the only thing that exists there is the copycat thing where they can actually maybe take apart something that, that's already been made, and then they can figure it out maybe how to do it a little better. But they can't come up with something new to make. <laughs> oh, boy. You see, this only happened in America. Because only in America could you keep it if you made it. Over there, it would be taken away from them. Now, the thing changes. I'm, if a Japanese person comes over here, it all changes. Now he can invent things too. You see, it's not his race, it's his economy. See, because you can't say Italians are stupid because Marconi invented the radio. It's just, in Italy, they don't do anything. Okay? And neither would you if you lived in Italy, and neither would I, because it's just taken away. It's better off to just go down to the beach and go swimming and forget it, which they've been doing for 5,000 years. <laughs> All right, we went literally from horse and buggies to the age of flight in about, oh, just a little over 100 years after the Constitution was written. Isn't that interesting? Now, what marked that period of time? What was the distinguishing characteristic? The distinguishing characteristic was no income tax, and no inflation. Are we having fun? That's what produced the greatest progress the world has ever seen. So our thesis today is the greatest, the most patriotic, the most red-blooded, all-American thing you could possibly do is make all the money you can make and pay no tax. It's, it's, it's America one. Now what we're going to show you is that there were two countries. Okay? We have here America one and we have here America too. Let me explain the primary difference between the two of them. This was what we call a constitutional republic. All laws were based upon the Constitution of the United States. In 1913, the, the Constitution was a flawed to such an extreme event that it made it a completely different country. You could no longer uh, keep all the money you made, and you could no longer pass property on to your children and so forth, okay? It was an entirely different country, and it became what we call a legislative democracy. The legislative democracy today runs side by side with the Constitutional Republic. And you can choose, they're both, incidentally, just out of pure coincidence, called America. They're both called the United States, you see, because the idea is to fool us, but they are different countries. And they exist side by side today, okay? Now, you, you can still live in America One, but you have to know how, and that's what the rest of our seminar is about. Is this fun or what? <laughs> okay? This is 
like a return to our roots. <laughs> okay, now, you see, because this is going to strip everything away. The primary book up here was the Constitution of the United States, actually based with the Declaration of Independence, where God, we are created, um, uh, and of course, uh, endowed by our Creator with these unalienable rights. Notice it wasn't inalienable rights. The inalienable has a different, these were unalienable. Nobody could put a lien on it. The government, it says governments were instituted on men to secure these rights. Now, notice what's happening down here. The government is putting the liens on. <laughs> Up here, their job is to keep the liens off so nobody can lien your property. You can still live here. There's ways to do it. Okay? I mean, this is great stuff. The people that you read about, well, actually, the people you don't read about, the super rich, you, you know, you, we get this garbage in the newspaper, you know, but every year, the richest guy in the world is some guy who owns a drugstore or some guy who owns a department store. I mean, come on. You know, where's the guys with the banks and the oils, okay? They're up here. How come, how come they aren't listed as the richest men in the world? Well, because we're going to show you they have been able to, uh, to own this property or control this property without owning it. See, Rockefeller really doesn't own Standard Oil. He just controls it. The Rothschild Bank of England really doesn't own our Federal Reserve System. It just controls it. Hey, is that great or what? See, if you control it, there's no tax on control. There's only a tax on ownership. Got it? <laughs> but the guys with the drugstores and so forth, well, they are really making a lot of money, according to the Wall Street Journal. But all the guys that are really heavy bucks are always missing from these charts. <laughs> okay, amazing what we learn when we get out of school. Let's go back into some history now and figure out what happened, what caused all this. Because if we don't understand the past, we don't understand the present. Isn't this interesting? All right. So I want to go back to, uh, oh, our Garden of Eden scene again. Of course, then we had a flood, and the flood went away, and people started a thing called the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel was where uh, some guy made a record and called it, I'll do it my way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so they had to speak different languages, go different parts of the country, okay? Yeah, different parts of the world, okay? Now, we, around the Mediterranean, what we call the Western world, uh, sprang up some world governments of sorts. The first major world government that we hear about is Egypt. And this is all, of course, in the Old Testament of the Bible. There were your pharaohs. Egypt was a very interesting country because the guy at the top considered himself to be God. This may surprise you. <laughs> See, people, people in government always like that title. <laughs> it comes with the job, it seems. <laughs> uh, yes, they really enjoy that. All right? So, you see, and so... To do anything against this guy was considered blasphemy. Well, you can't beat that. Any kind of revolution was a rebellion against God, you see. And uh, they, had the, they worshipped the sun, and they had temples that they met in, and they had temple uh, priestesses and temple prostitutes and temple this and temple that, and, and they had all this, uh, you know, these strange things that they worship, like the, uh, you know, different phenomenon, okay, like frogs and, and so forth that they worshipped in Egypt. Well, Egypt was eventually conquered by a country called Assyria. Assyria was, uh, oh, sort of up where Iran, Iraq are today in that area. And uh, they conquered Egypt. Now, the guy who ran Assyria, this, this may come as a shock, considered himself to be God. <laughs> See, notice the name and the location changes, but the title remains the same. Okay? And they had a temple thing, and they had uh, sun worship, and uh, they, uh, you see, it's kind of like the same thing. Well, this goes on for a few years. And then there were some guys from Babylon, which is down uh, further south uh, from Assyria. Babylon, and uh, they conquered Assyria. Isn't that interesting? Now, uh, in Babylon, uh, the guy, who, the king up there, uh, well, for some reason, thought he was God. You see, same deal. They had temples, and they had these rituals. They worshiped the sun, and da-da-da-da. Okay, ready? Okay, another world empire comes along, conquers this Babylon. This is the Medo-Persian. Medo, the Medo, the Medo, the Median tribes up in the north were basically you're up around the, the Baltic Sea up in there. And then you had the Persians, Medo-Persian, okay, which is where Iran is today. Okay? Now, the thing that characterized this guy was that he thought he was God. See how this changes from time to time, okay? So we have God, 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 God. Got it? See, history isn't that hard to remember, okay? Now, okay, and things went along pretty well until he was conquered by Greece. Alexander the Great conquered this. Alexander the Great was an interesting guy. 
Uh, one item of note about him was that he thought he was God. Okay? And uh, they had a little, he worshipped the sun and a few things, and they had a little temple prostitutes, temple priests, and so forth, and uh, pretty much the same thing. And then he was conquered by Rome. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> and the Roman Caesars had this little trait that they like to have people call him, you know. <laughs> I, it went something like God. <laughs> See? So the guy who runs government always thinks he's God. <laughs> this is not something that the IRS just created recently. <laughs> this has been going on for some time. See, if we don't understand history, we don't understand the National Enquirer, okay? As we go through Safeway, our trip is meaningless. Okay, now, so what happens, okay? <laughs> so we find here is that in order to be able to understand this, we have to have a grasp on what's been going on before we got here, okay? <laughs> now we're ready to understand ourselves. All right, now, let's erase this again. This is going to be fun. Ta -da. This is getting easier. Oh, that, that lubricated. I guess there was no lubrication under something. Okay, there we go. All right, now, so if we took this another way, we say from 3,000 years B.C., okay, for the first 3,000 years until the time of Christ, we have a government that was primarily involved with external control, don't we? external control even the old hebrew religion if they if you want to know what the what to do well some guy went up to the mountain and he got some tablets and he brought these tablets back <laughs> and said guys here's what we're going to do notice it was not a democratic meeting because they would have come up with the golden calf if they did it wouldn't they okay but he came up with these tablets you see and said thou shalt not steal thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife and all these things well hey that's not what we want to do is it <laughs> see that was external that was external stuff, see? And he says, if you do this stuff, you're going to die. Okay. So, guys have been trying it ever since. <laughs> okay, now, so what happens, okay? And uh, so what ha causes a lot of death? Okay. <laughs> okay, you see, this doesn't come from what the guy wants to do. It comes from an external source. The guy at the top had this little attribute. He was always right. Because he was God. <laughs> now, you can't beat that for authority. <laughs> That's as good as it gets. Okay, now, okay, along comes our friend Christ now. Interesting guy. And his name was Emmanuel. Does anybody know what Emmanuel meant in Hebrew? God with us. God is with us. See, God isn't afar. God isn't out there. God is with us. See, and he comes along now. He preaches the gospel of the kingdom. This is really interesting. <laughs> and where did he say this kingdom was? Anybody have any idea? Well, he said his kingdom was within us, didn't he? And right, it wasn't of this earth. It was within us. See, and so John explains that. He comes along and, and he says, well, greater is he who's within you than he who's in the world. Can anybody see a conflict arising here? <laughs> you know what they did with this guy? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> not good. <laughs> Kim Osabe, not good. <laughs> you notice what he did? He introduced the concept of internal control, didn't he? Oh boy, problems, problems. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> now, what we're gonna show you for the next half an hour, and how much time do we have till the break here, uh, Guy? Well, what time did we start? Okay, so it's, we've been going, okay. So let's go for about an hour and take a break, and then we'll come back for another hour and take another break. And then we'll come back, and then there will be no break after that. No, I'm kidding. Now, okay, so, <laughs> all right, nobody will come back after that. <laughs> now, see, because I submit to you that if we understand this, we'll understand, like, what's going on with our paychecks. Okay, so for the next uh, 15 minutes, and then we'll have a break, I want to talk about what was the effect of internal control on the world. Because there was some effect. If you look at a map, and I'm, I'm, I'm not a good cardiologist here, but cartologist but anyway what you have is the Mediterranean Ocean something like this and you got Africa and you have Arabia Peninsula and you got India over here and you've got uh, Europe and Scandinavia coming over here like this and you've got England over here all right now there you've got what's called the Caucasus Mountains now out of this melting pot if you will or the beginning of civilization we find there were two flows one flow went this way and one flow went this way both of them ending up in England England is our pivot point here in history it's interesting, okay? Now, what you're going to find 
is that these people had internal motivation. Okay, these people became what we know as your uh, Caucasians. They became known as the Anglo-Saxons. There's all kinds of names for them. They went into Germany where they became the Teutons. They went into Scandinavia where they became the Vandals and eventually the Vikings. They had one, one characteristic that was impeccable. They were never conquered by anybody. Nobody messed with them. <laughs> they were not very civilized, but nobody, nobody had any truck with them, okay? Because they just didn't kill you as look at you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's you. <laughs> that's roots. <laughs> Okay, you see, but the internal thing was like on. And they, they would have raids on England, they'd have raids on all these places, they'd come out of the forge, you know, and they had this god called Odin. You know, well, it's interesting, we'll get into all that, but he, uh, <laughs> he ran the bank and a few things. Okay, now, along here, we have basically our, our Latin type people, okay, which is Greece, Italy, uh, France, Spain, and so forth. Now, the characteristic of this group of people was external control. Matter of fact, they went into France, and, and today we find Ireland is populated by, by your people from France, whereas Scotland is populated by people from Scandinavia, basically, okay? So you find a big difference in the people. You'll find a big difference in their governments. You'll find a big difference in how they relate to things as a culture. Now, if a person leaves and goes to another culture, then he will change. It's not a racial characteristic. It is a cultural characteristic. But this seems to be inherent in the culture for some reason, all right? Along here was the Roman Catholic Church, for example. They would burn you if you if you read the Bible. <laughs> you, did, you didn't read the Bible. And the, matter of fact, uh, in, uh, well, we're going to find here some interesting things. The Tyndale actually do, uh, read the Bible in English in, seven, in 1377. He was burned at the stake <laughs> because he stole the church property. Yeah. I mean, see, what did that do to the church? Well, if you could read the Bible, you, you wouldn't need their external control, would you? See the difference, okay? So we're going to see that all the way down, this has conflicted with government, whether it's church government or civil government. There's been this tremendous conflict now between internal and external control. America I was internal control. America II from 1913 is external control imposed on us. Did anybody voluntarily pay his income tax last year? No, it was stolen from you, wasn't it? <laughs> it was stolen. You couldn't even get it back. See, it was external. You didn't decide that. Somebody else decided it. Then there, but see, that, was, that wasn't existing in America I. When we understand this, we'll come out of here with a great power that we didn't have when we walked in here. You quit work, yeah. Well, <laughs> the, the secret is you quit working for someone else. <laughs> now you want to work for yourself because you get to keep it if you work for yourself. See the difference? Okay. So what happens over here is that this culminates in what we call the feudal system. We had, over in England, we had a king. Now, king means sovereign in Latin, the terms of Caesar, okay? It means the guy who owns the place, the guy who owns the land. The guy who owns the land usually has all the power and all the wealth. It's not very simple. The power is in the land, as far as economics are concerned, okay? In, in uh, German, that's called Kaiser. In Russian, it's called Tsar. In English, it's called king. It's the same word. It comes from the Latin word sovereign or Caesar. Okay, the king had his nobles, the knights, the dukes, the duchess, the earls, the barons, and so forth, and that was about 5% of his population. And then the people who actually did the work were the serfs, the 95%, okay? Now, how this shook down was that your people from this area down here came and became your serfs, and the people from this area came down and became the nobles. And so you had this, this noble, noble class here of people, Now I wouldn't say class, this noble category of people. It wasn't a class, it was sort of like... They were just the guys. The king had a proper system of rents. He would rent the land to the nobles, who in turn would sub rent it to the serfs. So everybody had to do their fair share and all this kind of stuff, whatever. That meant as those you could get by with. Because nobody could keep what he earned. Even the nobles were being changed. And as a matter of fact, uh, Prince, uh, this guy John was really a nut, this King John. And uh, he, his, his favorite entertainment after a meal was to have the curtains part and, and have watch nobles being hanged. They did hang nobles after dinner as a, for sort of a treat. And guys would go, Bleh. and uh, so the nobles got together and they said, you know, this is not good for our health. And so what they did was that they, they, got, they got a big army together. The barons got a big army together and they, uh, they uh, asked John to come down for a little seminar they were having south, <laughs> south of the Thames River there in Runnymede. And, uh, and so they surrounded John with their army and they said, John, we would like you to sign in the year 1215, we would like you to sign a document uh, called the Magna Carta. 
And the king says, well, what does that mean? They said, well, it means magnificent contract. He says, yes, I know, but what does it do? And they said, oh, it gives us the ownership of England. <laughs> you see, after today, you won't own England anymore. We'll own England. I mean, was this a deal or what? <laughs> Never in the history of time had anybody ever come up with that idea. It came right out of these guys. They, it was a Viking stuff, see? <laughs> so John says, well, well, you know, he goes out for a little break. He looks at his army. He says, well, why would I say anything like that? And they said, well, if you'll sign it, then we won't cut your head off this afternoon as scheduled. <laughs> so we, we do a lot of seminars across the country. We do a lot of motivational training with our agents and so forth. And basically, we found that you can't beat that for a good close. <laughs> and so the king bought a Magna Carta. He signed on the line which was dotted, and now the Magna Carta is in effect. The king was no longer the sovereign in England. Isn't that interesting? The king didn't own the place. The nobles owned the place. Did this have an effect on England? You bet. You bet. Because it wasn't very long later, until about 1295 here, some interesting things happened, because this was our Magna Carta. Okay? They said, well, look, this is really kind of crazy. We own the land, and the king is still taxing us. The king was putting the tax on the land. He's still collecting the tax. And so the guys got together. They said, well, this doesn't make any sense. So they went to the king in 1215, and they said, king, we want to start a parliament. And he said, well, what's that? And they said, well, that's where we make the law instead of you. <laughs> the king looks out the army, out the window, he sees their army, and he says something like, okie dokie. <laughs> Reminds me of a story about Jimmy Carter. Supposedly, David Rockefeller called up Jimmy Carter back in the late 60s and said, Jimmy, if we make you president of the United States, would you do everything I tell you? And Jimmy thought, and he said, peanut butter. Okay, so anyway, so what we have, you see, is basically the same thing, okay? So the king now no longer made the king. <laughs> it's really hard to do serious seminars. Okay, now, so what happens? So the king no longer made the law. The law was made by the nobles. And what do you suppose they decided? Well, they wouldn't pay tax. <laughs> what a shock. <laughs> just like that. I mean, just pass the law. The nobles from now on would not be taxed. <laughs> Are we having fun? So now what did they do? Well, they went all to the world. They went into Africa, they went to India, they went to China, they went to Austria, Australia, they went to the New, the new World, the new, uh, North America. And every place they went, the nobles could make everything they wanted to make, and they were never taxed. Now, occasionally, the indigenous citizens wanted to tax them, like Mahatma Gandhi or something like this, and they would, uh, they would decide, okay, since these guys from England are getting all the natural resources out of our country, we want to tax them. Now, the noble had a solution to that, okay? What he would do then is that he would bring in the British Army. <laughs> and the government now would no longer be an indigenous government. It would be called a colony. See, a colony is where the laws are made from London. Is, are we, is this interesting? Where the, now the nobles make the law, and they decided that they wouldn't even be taxed in any part of the world. <laughs> And if they had a problem with that, the British Army would go in. Now, what happened, you see, was that the British Army was protecting the business of the nobles. The British Army went all over the world. It came to the point where the sun never set on the British Empire. The British Empire was simply the nobles making all the money they wanted to make and keeping it. We now understand British Empire. That's all it was. And to make sure that there weren't any problems, they had an army. <laughs> and it was a good army. This army, uh, before 1700, w w went 300 years undefeated. All the powers of the world put together could not defeat the British army. It was incredible. It was powerful. Nobody fussed with the British army. Well, that was uh, Parliament, 1295. Okay, then as we pointed out, some interesting things happen here. See, notice what we're learning. A little bit of internal control. A little more internal control. You see why history cannot be taught in the government school? Because it's going contrary to the government philosophy. And so it's just not taught. It's called, it's not there, existentialism. <laughs> okay, now, okay? Okay, so then along about 17, or 1379, we have Tyndale. Tyndale printed the Bible language. He was burned, okay, Tyndale. Okay, along about 1420, we have, uh, or I'm sorry, that was Wycliffe, excuse me, that was Wycliffe. I get these guys all mixed up here. That was John Wycliffe. He was burned at the stake. Okay, John Tyndale had the same thing happen to him. Okay, that was that was a like hundred years later. Okay, many many years later. Okay, we have uh, Tyndale, and then Wycliffe up here. 
All right, and, and uh, Henry VIII cut his head off because Henry VIII was a Roman Catholic at the time that was against their, their law. Well, Henry VIII now had some interesting problems because he didn't have a son. After he'd been married to this uh, uh, Catherine of Aragon for eight years, he, he'd had a couple of girls, but no, no male children. And so he went to his archbishop, Sir Thomas More, and he said, Tom, he said, I'm paraphrasing this, I, I want a divorce. And Tom says, good grief, uh, Henry, you can't have a divorce. You've been married eight years. He said, that's okay, I want, a, I want an annulment. <laughs> and he said, you got an annulment, eight-year marriage. And so he checks with the Pope and says, can't be done. So Henry has a very novel and imaginative, creative solution to this problem. He cuts off Tom's head. Okay? And then he starts a church called the Catholic Church of England. And he is the Pope. Is this interesting? And of course, then he went ahead and introduced the concept of disposable wives. Right now. And so what happens, you see, <laughs> is that now there was a new church. The Holy Roman Empire had just uh, collapsed. Now, the Holy Roman Empire was neither Holy Roman nor it was an empire. All it was was that the Pope blessed the kings. So it made the king have the benefit from the, from the, uh, from the, the so-called so God man or whatever have you, okay? Now, so you see, <laughs> see, the system really is still, they're still trying to push it. Okay, it's interesting. Okay, that the, that the guy on top is God. <laughs> okay, interesting stuff. All right, now, uh, to, to shield it within the framework of our country now, you don't know who the guy is. Like, who is the guy that owns the Federal Reserve System? Well, let's see, we know the Federal Reserve System is not an American corporation. We know it's not a government agency. We know that the president can, have, can appoint governors, but governors don't own the place. Who owns it? Well, obviously, it must be God. <laughs> Isn't that interesting, you see? Hmm. Okay, the internal control is wrecking the external control. There's a conflict going on. Don't kid yourself. And you can choose which side you want to be on. One is like a wave coming in. One's a wave going out. You know, this is like the rest of the reason Russia collapsed is because it was going the wrong way. If you go the wrong way, you collapse. If you buy into America too, you're going this way. You will collapse. You won't own anything on Friday. You'll work 40 years and be broke. You'll die spending your kids' inheritance. You don't, the kids don't have any inheritance. You've got to live off them. Because the thing is going this way. Now, it doesn't have to go this way. This is what our meeting is all about. Okay, interesting stuff. So we have 1420 comes along, Tyndale. All right. Henry VIII now, in, in 14, uh, 14 uh, I'm sorry, 1440, excuse me. In 1442, Henry VIII now uh, has written in the British Constitution that the King of England is the head of the church. That's still in the British Constitution, by the way. Did you know that a few years back, and it says in the British Constitution, by the way, that if a commoner marries a member of royalty, it requires the permission of the church. I mean, the, the church, the government over in England still runs the Anglican church. Now, did you know that a few years back, when Prince Charles wanted to marry Princess Diana, or whatever her name was, that, that that required the permission of the church, you see? And his mom said, okay, all right? No. <laughs> Again, again, not knowing history makes, us, makes the uh, National Enquirer undecipherable. Okay, now, you see, once we get history, we have an interesting shot at it, don't we? We have an interesting shot at it. Okay, now we have Henry VIII come along. Well, Henry VIII uh, began what was called the Anglican Church, and he took Tyndale's Bible. You know, it was really interesting that Tyndale's prayer, just before his head was cut off, was that, the, was that God may open the eyes of the Church of England, or the King of England. And in, uh, in about 1445, Henry VIII decided that Tyndale's Bible was pretty good after all. He had manuscripts printed or written and put in all the churches in England. Isn't that interesting? So he changed his mind. <laughs> so for Tyndale, it was a little bit late. Okay? But the interesting thing is, see, even though guy dies physically, his works live on. This is kind of an interesting concept. Because even though these guys were martyred, they were very effective. They were, they were, they were really instituting internal control, even though their body was taken away. This is heavy stuff. Okay, now, this goes along now uh, until about uh, 15, or t until about uh, 1599. And again, I'm just jumping through this. You can get back into history and you can find all kinds of stuff. I mean, I'm just, just skipping through, the, through the, the rocks here. I mean, there's a lot of stuff here. Okay, 1599, we had Gutenberg. Okay, what happened to Gutenberg? Well, he invented the movable type press. Up until this time, there weren't any libraries because nobody had any books. The only books were in monasteries or somewhere they were laboriously hand copied. Now all of a sudden Gutenberg uh, invents a printing press, movable type, okay? Da -da -da -da. What happens in 1601? 
the king of, of uh, Scotland, James, comes down, the Stuart kings, because they, uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, was back in, uh, Henry VIII's daughter, uh, running England and converting, putting all the Protestant or so-called Anglican people in. This is why John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, wrote it in prison, because all the preachers were put in prison, and uh, the, the Roman government was brought back, the Roman church was brought back, and so uh, Henry, or so James comes down from Scotland, and he completely takes over England, and he introduces the, uh, the, actually what was called the, the Scottish Presbyterian Church at that time. He didn't even introduce the Church of England. Okay, and, but he had all the Bibles printed in English. Isn't this interesting? So this King James Bible now was produced about 1611. So here we have the King James Version of the Bible. And it was written in English. And it was printed on a press, and everybody was given a copy. So the government sanctioned everybody in England now having a copy of this Bible. Well, you'd think that'd be the end of the problems for England. That was the start of their problem. <laughs> because guys would start reading this Bible now, and this was amazing because they never had a book before. So they wanted to learn to read, they read from the Bible. They wanted to teach somebody to read, they read from the Bible. They wanted to have a book at home, they had the Bible. It was the only book there was. <laughs> Well, it had a tremendous effect on England. It's the basis of the whole English language. Okay? It also changed England radically because it said in the Bible that Jesus Christ was the head of the church. Uh-oh. <laughs> Does anyone see a conflict? <laughs> mm -hmm. And so they decided, well, we want to start teaching our children that Jesus Christ is sovereign. They said, no, no, the government will teach the, church, the kids because we want to teach them that the king is sovereign. <laughs> We've now understood public education, haven't we? Who's the sovereign? You're going to get different stories depending on the source of the education, aren't you? And for the government to be sovereign, it must run the schools. That's the 10th platform of the Communist Manifesto, by the way. This, that can't happen until governments run the schools. Oh, boy. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. Now, so it doesn't take these guys very long. It takes like nine years. <laughs> and these guys just blow. I mean, they blow. They said, this isn't right. They said, let us get thee out of here. They get some boats, and they sail. <laughs> They sail over. <laughs> they sail over to America. Nobody even went there before. <laughs> I mean, that was it. You see, they wanted to worship the sovereign, the spiritual sovereign. Well, okay. So now we have the Mayflower. Isn't that interesting? Now we often hear that, the, that these were called the colonies. Notice that's just recent history. They did not call themselves colonies or colonists. Isn't that interesting? They said that they would start, in the charter of the Mayflower Compact, they said, well, we really owe a debt of gratitude to King James, and we really think that was great, and now we're going to start a body politic. What's a body politic? It's a separate nation, isn't it? They just started a separate nation. Because out of this Bible, the Puritans got the concept that the self was governed by itself, not by somebody else. And that the self gave way to the family, and the family was run from within, that the family was best run inside than outside, which gave way to the church, and the church was better run inside than from outside, and which gave way also to business. And or their business should be run by them and not by the state, and they had their civil government should be run by them and not by somebody else. Totally internal. It was like, thanks, King James, but we'd rather do it ourselves. Well, Europe laughed these guys to scorn. Nobody had ever had a government run from inside. You know, always they had to have a king and all this kind of stuff. I mean, nobody, how could you have everybody run a government? Everybody own all the land? Ha, <laughs> this wasn't going to last very long. They sat back and these guys thought they could own the land, you see. Interesting, isn't it? What's so fascinating is it's still going. Okay? Now, all right. So you say, well, why didn't this idea catch on? Why didn't this just spread like wildfire and we all be born in the 30s, 40s, 50s, whenever we're born into countries that are all, all over the world have these constitutions and have these self-governments? What happened? Well, we're going to find out that there's a crowd of people. <laughs> as they say, we're going to find out that in the game, there's another team on the field. And there's a team on the field that doesn't like internal control because that way they don't have control over you. Now, in order to win this game, we have to know what this other team is. <laughs> and we're going to come back from our break, and it's called central banking. The boys live in the central bank, and the central bank gets to control the country. And I won't tell you how, because this is a big secret, and you'll, I don't want to spoil your next hour. Okay, but there's a word that explains it. Anybody know what that word is? Okay, we'll get into it next hour. We're going to explain it. Well, I'll, I'll give you a clue. The word is debt. The control... So forth was that uh, one of the one of the best well, probably the best thing on economics comes out of uh, 
of the Proverbs, written by Solomon. Proverbs is a book that Solomon wrote for his son, Rehoboam, who was probably a teenager when he wrote the book, but when Solomon wrote the book. But what it does is it explains economics. And economics is explained in one sentence. Matter of fact, it's not just explained once in one sentence, it's explained twice in one sentence. This is how complete the Bible is, all right? Let's take a look at this. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. That one doesn't work, does it? Let's try another one. Okay. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. Okay, that's not really great. Let's try another one. Okay, says that the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is the servant to the lender. Now, I think that probably the reason that it was written in the old Hebrew language is it was such a precise language at that time. You could actually, you could actually uh, put it into formulas or make equations out, if you will. So let's make a formula out of the language because it says it twice. Once, the rich rules over the poor. Secondly, the borrower is servant to the lender. See, it says the same thing twice. Okay, to, to formulate it, it says uh, the rich, okay, rule, okay, rule, actually the rich rule, okay, over the poor. That's the first thing it says. And then you can make a little plus over here. And it says the borrower is the servant or the slave in some versions, slave to the lender. Isn't that interesting? So now uh, I have this, uh, not only has had, had the, the fun of raising some, some kids, but I, now I've got grandkids to raise, okay? And they ask you all these questions. It's kind of, you know, kids want to know the answer. They don't want to fool around with a bunch of gobbledygook, okay? So, all right, if, if, if a kid were to ask you now uh, what a ruler is, how would you explain what a ruler is? What would you say? See, because if you say it's a king, that's not always true. If you say it's a president, because these guys aren't always ruling, are they? See, the answer comes right out of Solomon. Now, we've had 4,000 years to know whether Solomon knew what he was talking about or not, see? He was the richest man who ever lived and the wisest man who ever lived, in some respects. In some respects, he wasn't too smart. But on money, he was pretty smart. Okay? Okay, a ruler, got it? Ready? We're ready for some real economics. Is a rich lender. <laughs> there hasn't been any deviation in that, in that, in that definition for 4,000 years. That is definitely the ruler. The servant, or the slave, is the poor borrower. Now, when we go to business school, it, People's Republic of Berkeley or Harvard or something like this. What, what do we learn? We learn how to get out and borrow money so we can start a business, don't we? See, notice, wrong. That's not what we should be learning. So they teach us, it's really slave school. We got a catalog from Harvard and we thought maybe they would teach it different. We learn how to get to Washington. It seems, you, it seems that you go to Harvard and turn left. Okay, so what happens, you see, is that the whole education system is to put you under external control. Isn't that interesting? Do we understand why the manifesto says that the government must run all schools? Because that's what's going to be taught. This is, the, this is the progressive education of John Dewey. This was started by Horace Mann back 150, 40 years ago. And it's been culminated now into our present economic or education system, which has no education in it at all. All it is is external indoctrination. Any learning is purely coincidental. Okay. Now, this is economics. Some people understand it and some people don't. One guy who understood it, a very smart guy, was a name, guy born in Italy by the name of Consimo Medici. Consimo Medici started a bank in the year 1300. Okay, it was the Medici Bank. He was the governor of Florence, and Italy at that time was a loose confederation of principalities, Joao, Venice, Milan, all these different things, Genoa. And uh, he wanted to unify or control Italy. So what he did was he loaned money to Italy, to the prince in the principality. He had a bank up here, and he would loan money to the prince. Isn't this exciting? Now, we all know how that works. If the prince can't pay the loan back, then he gets the prince's country. See how that works? Is this fun? You, you know, have you ever seen anybody that couldn't make their car payment? They have this little tow truck comes out and tows it away. <laughs> See? Isn't that fun? See, this is called kingdom towing. Okay? And what they do is they tow your country away. <laughs> we, na we now understand poli sci. <laughs> That's all there is to political science. That's it. <laughs> okay? The process is called war. 
Every war that I know of that's been fought in the last 400 years has been over a money issue. It was never fought by governments or by people. It was fought for the benefit of banks. All we have to know is whose bank is, and we can understand war. Sometimes they own oil. <laughs> okay, now, so what happens here is that the bank comes along. So uh, about 1,400 now, uh, about 100 years of this, Medici is conquering this and conquering that. And every time he owns money, he has to have a big battle. So he conquered a, an area called Pisa in, uh, in Italy, and it had a finance minister by the name of Niccolo Machiavelli. Machiavelli was a young man. He was put in exile on his property uh, back in, in Pisa, and if he left his property, he was subject to be executed. All right? Machiavelli wrote a proposal to the Medici Bank, and he said, you guys have got this thing pretty good, but it could be better. This is a pretty brash thing for this guy to say, because he could have been executed at, at whim. And he said, every time you loan money and get one of these principalities from the prince, you have to have a war. And every time you're at risk, every time it costs you a lot of money, every time uh, it's a lot of work. He said, if you made me the number two man in the Medici Empire, now this guy's in exile, you know, Okay? He said, if you made me number two man, I will show you how you can confiscate every country in the world and you'll never have a war. Well, you think this got Medici's attention. So they brought him in and they said, and he said, now look, he said, you make me number two man. He says, if this doesn't work, you can cut off my head. This guy was a real gambler. <laughs> he says, if it works, I'm number two. And they said, okay. And they said, what's your plan? He says, well, it's not just a plan. You've got to do it. And they said, okay. What we're going to do, we're going to introduce a concept of balance of power. They said, balance of power? They said, yeah, balance of power. You've heard this phrase. We hear it all the time. Henry Kissinger uses it. George Bush uses it. Balance of power. Well, I guess he uses New World Order, doesn't he? Or something. <laughs> okay, same thing. All right. Now, so, <laughs> George, read my lips, Bush. Okay? <laughs> you know, you can always tell when George is lying. <laughs> His lips move. Okay, now, so, we don't call him George Bush. We call him George Shrub. <laughs> we don't feel he's mature enough to be a Bush. Okay, so, anyway, what happens here is that, okay, because, you see, all he's doing is he's fronting for somebody else, isn't he? Haven't you haven't noticed it? <laughs> all right, George is not his own man. <laughs> all right, we'll, we'll explain that, sir. <laughs> we haven't got to the funny part yet. Okay, okay, that's next hour. <laughs> All right, there you go. Okay, so he said, what you're going to do now is you're going to loan money to two princes. And they said, are you crazy? And he says, got to do it, got to do it. If it doesn't work, then... And they said, well, all right. So they loan money to two princes. Isn't this exciting? They loan money to Prince A and to Prince B, both. And the condition was that, prince, that the princes had to repay the loan. They couldn't pay it back with money that they printed, so the bank would run the money in the country here. So they would print the money, you see? Be control the money. Uh, the, all the speeches by the prince now had to be approved by the bank because it was imperative that the people, the rabble down here, didn't catch on that the prince was no longer running the country for their benefit, but for the benefit of a bank. This must never be disclosed, you see. And so the... the the speeches are written up here, and they're read down here. Get it? Okay? It's not always easy to find good speech readers. Uh, sometimes they have to go to Hollywood. Okay, now, and so then we have, we, have, uh, we have war, okay? So now we have a war. This guy has to go to war whenever he's told to go to war. So he reads the speech, and, oh, what do you know? We're at war. <laughs> Let's see. I guess we'll give him an ultimatum. You've got till Saturday. Well, then Saturday comes now. You've got till Wednesday. <laughs> okay, now... Okay, that, no, we just discussed the war in Iraq. All right, now, what happens here is that uh, I've just described to you the four identifying characteristics of the Federal Reserve System in the United States for the last 82 years. That's precisely what the Federal Reserve System has been doing with our government. It owns our government. Our government does whatever the bank wants because, you see, <laughs> when the bank started printing money without any backing, it was called a debt. And we pick up the interest on it. It's called the national debt. Why would we have a debt if we print our own money? Doesn't make any sense, does it? If you had a printing press in your basement, would you be in debt? <laughs> See, it's not, it's not our press anymore. It belongs to the Bank of England because now we're in debt. And we can't print our own money. They print it. It's been going on since 1913. You may have heard about it. It's called inflation. 
See, notice if you do it, it's called counterfeiting. <laughs> they have a little school up the state here. It's called San Quentin. Or, and they give the first that's the fence, I think, was 17 years of remedial printing. See, they'll teach you not to print. You can print menus and newspapers, but not money. Only they can print the money. We'll talk about who they are in our third hour, too, by the way. It's not a mysterious thing. It's actually six families. Okay? It's financial families, all right? Interesting stuff. Okay, so notice what's been going on here. We now have uh, a central bank. This differs from a national bank because until the year 1400, all that was on the planet was national banks. In other words, the bank was run by the government. Well, the government is going to have a debt to itself, so national debt was unknown of, virtually unknown of. Never unheard of. Nobody ever heard of it. Now, now, you see, the bank is no longer run by anybody in the government. Matter of fact, it's probably not even run by anybody in the country here. And we have a debt. And it keeps getting bigger all the time, doesn't it? Now, I have a lot of fun when I go out to a restaurant. I, I, uh, I get finished and I go up to the, uh, to the waitress and I say, listen, may I talk to the manager because all I have with me are notes. And she says, what? I said, yeah, I ate this dinner and all I got are some notes. Would your manager take a note? And she says, well, I don't know. You know go get the manager. I said, would you, would you take a note, sir? You know what do you mean? I said, well, I came here and I, <laughs> I had this dinner and it was very nice and I appreciate it. And I certainly don't want to steal from you, but all I have with me are some notes. Could you possibly take a note? And, and he says, well, what do you mean? I said, well, let me show you. And I pull this out here, and I show him these notes that I have, see? Because now if I bought a car from, your name is John? If I bought a car from John and I gave him a note, could John uh, buy anything with that note? Well, he might be able to get it to the bank, and maybe if my reputation is good, he could, he could borrow it, right? But notice the note is not money, is it? Notice carefully. The note is not money, because the note is in place of money. The note is something that you give somebody when you don't have any money. You notice carefully? The Federal Reserve System has printed a dollar here, and it says, Federal Reserve Note. <laughs> notice carefully, it doesn't say Federal Reserve Money, because there isn't any. Now, when a, when a dollar is printed, it is a debt. The debt is what you pay, and it's called the national debt. Are we having fun now? Do you understand why? Anybody who writes anything that makes any sense in an economics exam in any government school in the country would flunk? Because economics in, in school is designed to cover all this up, so you don't know what's going on. Now, this sounds radical, and it is. The question is, is it true? If it's not true, let me know, and hey, I'll stop all this and go get a job, okay? Now... <laughs> But if it's true, then we have trouble in River City, don't we? Okay, so your, your job today is to find out, okay, is this really true? Mm -mm. Okay, and uh, we're not asking for any immediate response. <laughs> it's pretty wild, I'm sure, for many people. All right, we have just described central banking. A central bank is where a foreign bank or a private bank can put a nation in debt. When the nation is in debt, the nation is the poor borrower. Isn't that interesting? And the lender is the ruler. Got the picture? The president reads what he writes. Well, this goes along. It runs pretty well. Medici became very wealthy, became very powerful. They went into all of Europe. Catherine de Medici ran France. One of the Medicis went up into the Scandinavian countries. But the family died out in the 1650s because they got a little bit too hung up on money. It seems that they decided no one else could marry in the family except Medicis. And this caused a little genetic problem. And uh, pretty soon their eyes wouldn't go in the same direction. They foamed at the mouth and a few little things like that. And as far as I know, there aren't any Medici's around anymore. I think they, they, they all went to bananas, okay? Now, so they just kind of died out. But the, the history is, is impeccable. They were the most powerful family that had ever lived on the face of the earth as a result of control through death. By the way, if you are into the Bible, you'll read the first five books of the Bible. One thing is to be avoided at all costs, and that's debt. Never get involved in usury. Pay enough interest, okay? Matter of fact, the, the old Jewish people, they had the, uh, the Old Testament, they had the year of Jubilee, where all debts were removed every 50 years, no matter how much was owed, and everybody started over, so that, <laughs> so that the land would never be moved from one family to another, because the land was to be held in perpetuity. That was exactly what our founding fathers gave us in America I. 
That's why they called it unalienable right. That means you own that property in perpetuity. Nobody, banks, governments, armies, nobody can take this away from you. Isn't this exciting? Did you know that in Southern California last year more homes were repossessed than were purchased? See, this is America 2. It's the reverse of America 1, isn't it? Everything America 1 gave you, government 2 is taking away. Got it? And it's your choice which one you want to belong to. We're going we're to explain that because this gets to be interesting. All right? So along comes a fellow at 1740 by the name of Meyer Bauer. Very brilliant man. I don't think history is an accident. I think it's made by brilliant men. And he, by the time he was 16, had graduated from school, from college. By the time he was 20, he was the finance minister for the King of Austria. And he thought in his mind, well, the reason the guy is the King of Austria is because he's the one with the gold. <laughs> this is sometimes referred to as the golden rule. All right, and he said now all he'd have to do to be a ruler himself is to get that gold. And so he made some surreptitious uh, loans, some uh, secret loans uh, to Germany through a couple families in Germany named the Cassell and the Hess households up there because a the non-German could not loan money to the king. But through these brokers, these German brokers up there, uh, he was able to loan money to King Frederick. And pretty soon, King Frederick was in debt to our friend Meyer Bauer. At this point, Meyer Bauer, a couple things happen. First of all, the king of Austria realizes there's no more gold in the treasury, so he goes into self-proclaimed exile in Denmark, where Shakespeare writes in Hamlet, by the way, be sure to see the movie, it's a good one, that there's now something rotten in Denmark. Okay, now, also, the King Frederick, King Frederick would read these speeches, and every time he'd read these speeches, well, he'd be deeper in debt and have more wars. Isn't that interesting? He became a very excellent reader, I should point out, probably one of the best readers in history. He was such a good reader that he is now called Frederick the Great. Okay, because he was a great reader. All right, and whatever Meyer, whatever Meyer wrote, Fred spoke. And Germany was involved in war after war after endless war, and all the young blood of Germans had died all over collecting debts for Meyer. Isn't this exciting? The only thing that was necessary is that the German people must never catch on what Freddie's doing. Oh, Freddie got all this money. I mean, after all, he had this little carriage, you know, little bumper sticker on, you know, shop till you drop. He liked to buy things, you know. And uh, Meyer was always there. How much do you want? Isn't this great? And all he had to do was read speeches. Hey, was this a good deal or what? See, it was only imperative that the people not catch on what was going on. And so for 200 years, the German people were military people, going to war after war, all the young people dying in the battlefields, and what a bunch of nonsense. Got the picture? Notice that's been happening in America for 80 years, too. <laughs> we go to all these interesting places on the planet, like Vietnam and Iraq, you know, isn't this great? To protect ourselves from all these bad guys. <laughs> Okay, we'll be getting to that next hour. It gets worse. Okay, now, so then he looks across the channel over here, and lo and behold, here's Prince George over here. Well, George was actually from the House of Hanover, strangely enough. He wasn't really pure German, or pure English. Isn't that interesting? And uh, he goes, uh, Meyer goes over there, who, and of course, uh, uh, he had the, the Merchant Bank of Hamburg over here. And um, interesting stuff, you see. Here's the world's richest country, the most powerful army in the world hadn't been defeated for 300 years. And Meyer goes over and uh, wants to know if he needs any help. <laughs> well, you know, kings are. They always need more money, don't they? And it wasn't very long until George got in debt to... Oh, by, I should point out that Meyer, by the way, when he took over Germany, to make sure that the name Bauer, which is a, which is a uh, Hungarian name, uh, because they didn't want to know that anybody in Germany was a foreigner, he changed his name to Red Star. Isn't that interesting? Now, you've heard of Meyer Red Star, haven't you? Oh, I'm sorry, the translation is Rothschild. <laughs> okay, Meyer Rothschild, or Red Shield, Red Star, okay? You'll notice in all the communist countries they have little red stars. See, well, another existential event. <laughs> there is no reason, it just happened. <laughs> sure. Okay? See, if we understand history, it gets to be pretty interesting because it's all economic, isn't it? Who's got the bucks? Okay? So... George goes over here and he gets in debt. He can't repay the loan. Uh-oh, repo time. So Meyer goes over and says, repo depot, George. And he says, I'm going to have to run the Bank of Germany. By the way, he's still running, or Bank of England. By the way, he's still running the Bank of England. When Meyer went over to run the Bank of England, he never left. He's still there. Isn't this interesting? It's the 13 square blocks of downtown London. England is not run from London. 
as far as the government is concerned, the government's out of Westminster. The Queen lives in Westminster, she's crowned in Westminster, and so forth and so on. The government of England is in Westminster. What's in London is the bank. If the Queen wants to go to London downtown, she can't go in unless she has prior appointment, because that's where her employer lives. And she must bow and curtsy, you see, if she wants to get some more money, because that's how it works. Well, Meyer couldn't, or George couldn't pay all the money back to our friend Meyer, okay? So Meyer goes over and he says, well, George, he says, uh, what seems to be the problem here? Why is the world's richest country having a problem paying my debt? And so he says, let's take a look at the books. He goes back and he takes a look at the books, and after a few months, he says, George, I noticed some interesting things. Back here in 1620, a bunch of guys took off in the Mayflower, and he says, George, I haven't seen any entries for their rent. He says, where is the rent, George, for the colonies? And George says, well, sir, he says, they don't really think they're colonists. They don't think it is a colony. And so uh, they were actually, they're a bunch of religious nuts, a bunch of mal malcontents. And we just said good riddance. And matter of fact, we let everybody out of prison. And they went over and started a thing over there called Georgia. And, uh, and, uh, and so the interesting stuff, which is true. And, uh, and so they, we just let all these guys out. So then we eased our expenses. We didn't have so many expenses, see. But uh, they would never send us any rent. And he says, well, George, he says, there you have your, your problem. He says, the solution is that you want them to pay rent. If you, after all, just stop and think, George, if they paid the rent, you could pay your debt. And George says, God, smartest guy in the world. Why didn't I think of that? See, sure enough, see? And he said, I'll send the army over right away. And George Meyer says, George, please sit down. He says, <laughs> good grief, no wonder you're just a king. He says, let me explain. <laughs> let me... Let me explain how you repossess a country. He says, armies are, are not the way you repossess a country. He says, armies only are good for collecting debts. He says, because to, to repossess a country, they're, they're too expensive, they're hard to control, they're too visible, and they cause a lot of resistance. He says, George, armies are not good. And George said, oh. And so he said, George, let me explain how you repossess a country. And George said, oh, goody, sir. Please, please explain. Okay, and so, <laughs> and so Meyer explained it. And George, of course, was a very good student. And it wasn't very long. Matter of fact, in the next uh, five years, uh, George levied 120 taxes on the colonies. He levied hat taxes, tea taxes, stamp taxes, fur taxes, shoe taxes, leather taxes. Everything was taxed. Isn't that interesting? The way you repossess countries, the way you repossess property is through tax. You want to get somebody's property, you don't beat them over the head because they'll come back and beat you over the head. That's very messy. You tax them. And they say, oh, here's my property, and they give it to you. <laughs> we now understand government. All right? So they, they sent the, uh, they, the, and so meanwhile, the, the George Washington and, and the Thomas Jefferson, these guys are here. Every time they'd wake up, they'd read the morning paper, and there'd be another tax. And they said, good grief, this keeps up. We're going to have to lose our land. So they went up to Philadelphia, and they had a couple little meetings called Continental Congresses, and they decided that they wouldn't pay these taxes. <laughs> Isn't that funny? See, they got some little bumper stickers on their chariots that said, just say no. <laughs> and, and so as a matter of fact, when, they, when, they, when the British wanted to tax the tea up in Boston, they went up and they dumped all the tea into the ocean. Well, this was a very significant event, okay? Because now that meant that there was a debt. So over comes the debt collectors. Isn't that interesting? The debt collectors now come over from England. You could always spot debt collectors in those days very easily because they wore red suits. And the Americans had a very novel, imaginative, and creative solution to this problem. They shot them. <laughs> well, this was considered sort of a joke because here was an army that hadn't been defeated for 300 years coming over in total from Europe and a bunch of ragtag farmers because there was only 4% of the people that didn't want to pay their taxes. 96% all said, let's pay them. It's not a whole lot different from today. <laughs> and the 4% know we're going we're to get our guns and we're going to fight them. And they fought them. Well, this wasn't going to take too long, you see. But so there's some surprises in this little thing, okay? Uh, it's called the Cold War because the Americans uh, were basically private uh, enterprise oriented and the British weren't. And so uh, uh, what the British would do if he won this war, he would go back to England and he would be a serf for the Lord in the manor again. He was fighting literally for his own slavery. And so the guys over here in America, like uh, Nathan Green, Nathaniel Green, and the Green Mountain Boys, and so forth, all they, they were real estate guys, okay? And uh, 
So what they did is they offered a package. They got a little presentation package for these guys. And they said, listen, any British soldier that comes into town on weekends or evenings and produces evidence that he is a deserter will get an immediate title to 160 acres of prime farmland in the Shenandoah and Appalachian Valley. Ever notice that? The whole East Coast from Maine down to Florida is sectioned into 160 acre parcels. It was given to the British Army. And every time General Cornwallis had reveille, there would be another company missing. <laughs> You've heard the old phrase, suppose they gave a war and nobody came? That happened. It was called Yorktown, 1781. The British did not have enough men show up. Here was the British now, faced with an enemy that had never won a major battle and that was freezing to death in the winters. And it was half naked and barefoot. And now listen, for, for the first time in 300 years, the British surrender to this enemy. That's a strange thing, isn't it? Why would Cornwallis surrender his sword to Washington? He had no troops, did he? Isn't this fun? <laughs> Notice, this was not a military victory. It was a real estate transaction. <laughs> we refer to it as Century 18. <laughs> Notice how carefully censored this is from any government school course on history. Because this would totally upset Johnny and make him maladjusted. This would not be good. So to protect Johnny, he's not taught this. You do understand that that's for his benefit. See, because what it showed was external, internal control was more powerful than external control. And whenever that's shown in history, it's not taught. We now know how history textbooks are written. History textbooks are written so that when you go to school for 12 years, you are so mind-numbed with external control that you don't know anything else. And you've now been adjusted. Well, this is interesting, you see, because now these guys went on and they designed a Declaration of Independence and all this stuff. This is pretty wild because they said, listen, we don't want to have any of these problems like they had over in Europe. We don't want to have any of this external control stuff. Is this fun or what? Thomas Jefferson, I believe, is the father of our government. Washington is the father of our, of our country. But the, the government pretty much was designed by Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was a student of John Locke. John Locke was an old Presbyterian over in England. And he, he did a lot of writing on this business of internal control stuff. This is not my idea. <laughs> okay. Okay. And what he said was that, uh, well, a lot of this stuff. But he went into Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 22, verse 11. Uh, and it said that uh, God is my lawmaker, my judge, and my king. And he says, aha, uh -huh, what Oliver Cromwell had done back in 1640, remember when he took over and cut off the king's head, Charles I, who was James' son, because he wouldn't uh, 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 give up this divine right of king's thing. There wasn't any divine right after he cut his head off. Of it. His blood was red, it wasn't blue, and it flowed like everybody's. And nobody came up with this idea of divine right of king's again. That was strictly hogwash that the Stuart kings came up with. You see? But he was executed. The first king in history was ever executed for violating the law. He had violated the Magna Carta. He had confiscated the nobles' property without a jury trial. He'd started what was called a star chamber court and he had regents and chancellors that he named and so forth. It was sort of like a tax court today. No jury. <laughs> if you accept that, you've accepted America too. You guys are accepting it every day. See, we're talking about where the cheese really binds here in our next hour. How all this comes together. You see, because there's this big dichotomy going on. Two countries running simultaneously in the same place at the same time. Oh boy. <laughs> and the boys have a problem because they can't implement the external control as long as you know that there's internal control. <laughs> oh, you can really make them upset. Okay, now, you can spoil their day. Okay, <clears throat> now, okay, see, where were we? Oh, yes, Thomas Jefferson. Okay, so along comes uh, Locke, and he reads in, in Isaiah that God is my, my judge, my lawgiver, my king. And he says, aha, because what, what Oliver Cromwell had done is he said, what you need now are to run along with the king are two houses of parliament. See? And, uh, and so he was close, but it collapsed. See? And so along come these guys 100 years later now, and they've got Cromwell to look at. They're, George Washington's idea of beating the government army, of beating the, the, the British army, was not new because Oliver Cromwell had done it in, 18, in 1640. You see, Oliver Cromwell had been the leader of parliament. And the king disbanded Parliament. He says, we don't want Parliament. We don't want all this Magna Carta. He disbanded Parliament, you see. And so Parliament went to war with the king. Isn't this interesting? 1640, it was the British Civil War. 
And Parliament won. After all these years, after, it was took about seven years, after Oliver Cromwell got involved, the British Army never won another battle. He'd never been in the military. He was 40 years old when he started, and he never lost a battle. He never retreated a foot. To read Oliver Cromwell's history is absolutely staggering. He did the totally impossible thing. He beat the king and cut his head off. So Washington and these guys says, well, hey, that's been done before. You know, This is no big deal. He said, we're 3,000 miles away. See? But what Cromwell did is he set up the two houses of parliament with the king. Okay? Now, and uh, he didn't have a king. He is what was called a protector. He started a title charge a protector. We'll come back to that in English law because there's a protector involved in trust. So we're going to be talking about trust our third hour. And there, you want your, your trust have, under English law to have a, and English law is the basis, by the way, for United States law because it's based upon the Magna Carta, which the Constitution is also. Okay, but anyway, uh, so along comes Thomas Jefferson uh, reading John Locke, and he says, what we need are three houses, no king, and three houses. You see, the, the executive, legislative, and judicial. Isn't that interesting? Because this is all comes out of the Bible. This is, see all this stuff? That's why they couldn't read the Bible? All this power, right in one book. It's incredible, right? And so, uh, 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 so they said, okay, what we'll do is we'll come up with a Declaration of Independence. And the Declaration of Independence says, we're endowed by our Creator with these unalienable rights of life, liberty, and property. And they're given to us, okay, the people. And then uh, the government is instituted among men to secure these rights. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> now, what made this so interesting, it was exactly upside down from what it, all previous history. <laughs> Just turn this thing around, and you've got everything that happened before. You see? You've got the government telling the people what to do. The rights are somewhere down below. They don't even have any, and the creator, well, that was something they could pick or choose from, but it didn't have any effect on government. You see the difference? Now, it says there's a natural law. Jefferson in the Declaration talks about a natural law of man, in which by birth he has rights to life, liberty, and property, and, and the governments are, don't even have anything to do with it. Matter of fact, governments are there just simply to secure it. Nothing happens to this guy and his property. Well, that's a pretty good purpose for government, isn't it? Too bad it changed in 1913, isn't it? Look at the progress that that concept created. It was incredible, you see? So in 1775, we had a war. Okay, in 1776, we have a Declaration of Independence. Okay, in 1787, we have a Constitution. The Constitution simply put the Declaration of Independence into legal form. It was not a popular document because it didn't limit government. So in 1791, we had the Bill of Rights with limited governments. The first, the first amendment, uh, the first ten amendments, the uh, first one says that government shall make no law establishing religion or regulating uh, anything thereof. Okay, it can't even regulate a church. Okay, and the second amendment says the government can't take away our uh, our guns because what do we protect ourselves against? Government. <laughs> Smoke the guy off the front porch. He doesn't take your property. It's very simple. <laughs> They can't get the property, they'll get the guns. A lot of truth to that. That's why that big big emphasis to register your guns, so because that's the next step to getting the property. All right, then you've got, um, uh, this comes along, and in 1791, unfortunately, they also started a bank. Uh, Two-thirds of it were the Rothschild Bank of England loaning money to the colonies because they were so happy with these colonies having defeated the British Army and everything. But you see, there's only two dangers that you have to your property. One is an army, and one is a bank. The only way you can lose your property is war or debt. Isn't that interesting? Otherwise, you're securing your property, aren't you? Okay, the government was to make sure that the war uh, and the bank both couldn't take our property. That was the function of government. Oh, boy. Well, in 1791, they went ahead with the bank, but Jefferson didn't like this bank, and he introduced a clause where it had to be renewed in 20 years. So in 1811, the charter for the bank was renewed, or it was up for renewal, and his disciple, James Madison, said, no, we don't want this bank. And they canceled the bank. They actually canceled the central bank. <laughs> Nobody ever done that before. Just said, no, we don't want it. Isn't that interesting? Let's see now. What happened in 1812? Oh, yes. The army came back. What a surprise. The army came back. Yes, okay. What do you know? What do you know? The army came back, and we had a war. The war was over in 1815, because in 1816, they started another bank. Is that clear? I'm skipping a lot of history. There's a lot of details that are interesting here, but we just don't have time to go into them. Let's see if I can get another blue pen or are we out of them here. Maybe I'll just write with a black one. <laughs> I don't like black, but the blue is kind of going on us. <clears throat> well, in 
Well, Jefferson or Jackson is so angry. G General Jackson, who defeated the British in New Orleans, he is so ang angry about this. In 1830, 1828, he runs for the presidency. And in 18, good grief. Well, let's see. I'll take a bunch of them here. Maybe one of these works. <laughs> I get one that works. I'll put the pile down. Okay. Okay. He was so so angry that in eight, 1832, he cancels the bank. No bank. Is that interesting? Hmm. Well, it takes care of that one. Those two. Okay. Stay tuned. The suspense is incredible. Okay. No bank. Hmm. Okay. All right. <laughs> is there a drugstore in the area? Okay, now. Okay. So, but then we had another war in 1860. Isn't this interesting? 1860 war. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, notice that there is a history. We're taught that there's no, there's no pattern to history. It's just uh, random events. Well, let's take a look at these random events. What did they lead up to? Well, it says that there was a bank, no bank war, bank, no bank war. All the banks were British. All the armies were British. Got the picture? What a coincidence. What a shock. We go to school and we get all confused thinking that England and France or some of our enemies and Britain's always coming to our aid, da -da -da -da, all this nonsense. See, history is to cover this up. Adjustment is when you don't know what happened. In the Civil War, that was an interesting picture because you had basically the bank, which is the city, the, the 13 blocks of downtown London, which is called the city. It's still called the city. It's a code name. Any bank with the name city in it is a Rothschild bank. Isn't that interesting? So city bank, city corp, city land, all these things. It's a little code name, so uh, you can understand it. The bank has an inside. Okay. What they did in the Civil War was they controlled five different countries. They controlled Germany. Okay, they controlled England. They controlled France through Napoleon, and we don't have time to play into all that. The Napoleonic Wars are real interesting. Italy and Austria, okay? The banks were in all of these places. Matter of fact, if you, you, you see Germany is here, England's over here, Paris is down here, uh, Italy's over here, Austria's over here. If you draw a line to all of the central banks in Europe, it forms a red star. <laughs> Go home on your European map and draw it. It's real interesting, okay? All right, just a little coincidence, I'm sure. <laughs> George Catlin Marshall was a big hero in 1940 because he designed our headquarters for our armed services. And it's a place uh, east of Washington, D.C., and it's called a Pentagon. And we have a star in this country, don't we? This is fun. George was really a great guy. We'll get into George maybe a little bit later if we have time. Okay. Notice there are two countries missing in the Civil War, the United States and Russia. These two countries got together and defeated uh, the bank in, in 1860. We'll, we'll come to that later. We won't get into that right now. We're going to go back a little bit and talk, talk some more here. Okay, about this. <clears throat> the bank did not have the control over the country that it wanted because there was no central bank here. Matter of fact, that's why the war was fought. We wouldn't accept a central bank. We now understand history. The rest is detailed. Okay? It's like flying over the Grand Canyon. You've now seen it. If you want to go back with a pack mule and a little hammer and some, you know, whatever you can, because there's a lot more to it, but you've seen it. <laughs> you now know what Grand Canyon looks like. Okay? Now, so that's, that's history. Okay, history is simply the, the, the money. Okay? Now, unfortunately, this is not all that took place during this period of time, because over in Bavaria in 1776, the boys in the bank realized that they could not conquer countries through military control. This just would not work. So in 1776, actually back in 1462, Ignatius Loyola had begun an organization called the Illuminati. The Illuminati was a part, and he also was the creator of the Jesuit order. The Jesuit order has been in and out of favor with the Pope for, for centuries. And it's called, the, they have what's called the Black Mass and a few things like this. They do some things the Pope doesn't like, including run the Vatican Bank. And if you really want to see a very, very good motion picture on the subject, it's Godfather III. Because it talks about when the Vatican Bank needs money, it goes to the mob. <laughs> now, what happens with the mob? Well, it has a guy that has a chair now on the bank, doesn't it? See, and what happens? It, you know, so forth and so on. Because it's an interesting intermixture of, of bank and or church and non-church play, okay? <laughs> and by the way, uh, there was a fellow came over by the name of uh, Giannini, A.P. Giannini, back around the turn of the century. 
And he started a bank over here. Does anybody know what the name of the bank was? Bank of Italy. It was the Bank of Italy. And in the 20s, they had a name change. What's it called today? Bank of America. Is this fun? Got it? See, the boys are still playing, aren't they? Okay. It is not as strong as a bank as it used to be because a couple of years ago, until Claussen came back from his, his meeting with the trilateral, his chair on the trilateral commission and so forth, uh, the bank was going into debt. You remember that? They were almost broke here about four years ago. And now they're back on the track, okay? It seems that, that the Federal Reserve Bank can get, can get guarantees from the government on its loan to foreign governments, and the Bank of America couldn't. Uh, there was something going on. Claussen comes back, and now Bank of America, can, 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 our, our government will guarantee their loans. See? It's under new management. Okay. So now we understand banking. We understand war. So, hey, we're making some progress, serious progress. All right, we had an organization here. It was this infiltrated? They infiltrated this Illuminati in uh, 11. This was your bank, guys. And they created uh, a fellow named Adam Weishaupt here. And uh, they put it under, basically, the control of the bank. Uh, it went ahead and infiltrated the Masonic Order in Paris, the Grand Orient Lodge, and so forth. They tried to infiltrate the... Uh, uh, the Scottish Rite Movement in England, and there was a fellow by the name of John Robeson who was so upset with this, he wrote a book called Proofs of the Conspiracy and blew the Illuminati away. He was the top Scottish Rite uh, uh, master in, in England at the time, and uh, he, he wrote a book, a very, just an excellent book. And if you have time for all these books, that's fine. You know, it took me 10 years to read them all, <laughs> but I'm sure glad I did. All right, uh, but uh, at any rate, uh, they tried to infiltrate uh, England, and that didn't happen right away as far as that was concerned. But what they did was they created what was called the League of the Just Men. They also started the French Revolution in 1791. You had the French Revolution. The French Revolution was the prototype. If you understand the French Revolution, you understand all these so-called socialist or communist revolutions that have taken place ever since. This, the king was not even involved in it. It was, or the French people weren't even involved in it. It was a foreign, it was a foreign group of people who were brought in from the southern Mediterranean, and they were dressed up like French people, and they were all laughing because men were dressed up like women and everything, and then they went and they stormed the Bastille and they cut the king's head off. A few miles away, guys were farming, the French people didn't know anything about what was going on. We're taught in history, this was the French people rising up against their king. The king simply would not have a bank. After the French Revolution, France had a bank. And they put their revolutionary functionaries in there, Robespierre, Danton, St. Just, Marat, and they kept guillotining these guys until they ended up with Napoleon in 1801. And he was a 24-year-old general. It seems that 24-year-old generals don't ask many questions. They just do what they're told, don't they? He went ahead and conquered Italy and Austria, put them under the Rothschild influence. Of course, then he came back, wanted to be king of France, and he was exiled in England because he, they didn't want him king of France. <laughs> and he came back to take over France, and he was going to work with Wellington out of England. And of course, Wellington attacked him. Surprise. And that was called Waterloo. When Nixon tried to do it, they called it Watergate. Okay, so anyway, you see, you don't back, go back on the boys when you start playing their game. You just, you just don't do it. It's considered bad. They own you if you play ball with them. And the revolution always eats its own, as we can see with our Senator Cranston, who now has some serious problems and can't run for re-election again. <laughs> He's out of favor with the bank. Okay, and of course we can go to the savings and loans, and all it is is putting them under the, under the Federal Reserve System because they weren't, you see. Anytime there's a problem, well, our taxes take care of it, and... The boys go under the control of the Red Star. Is this fun or what? Okay, now we understand federal savings loans. Hey, we're moving. Okay, now, 1791, okay. In 1812, they created an organization called the League of the Just Men, after St. Just, one of the, the conspirators up here. And their plan was to come up with a program that would have people all over the world voluntarily give up their property to the bank. And this, of course, took some serious thinking. This took many, many years of, of talking and and planning and so forth. And uh, finally, by 1832, there was a fellow in the United States in New York by the name of Clinton Roosevelt. Clinton Roosevelt came up with a plan that he thought would enable this bank to control all the property in the world. And he put it in a little booklet, and he mailed it over to the Bank of England. And his plan called for, number one, the abolition of all private property. Isn't that interesting? the abolition of private property. He said this would be done in the next nine platforms. The first one would be a heavy progressive graduated income tax. And he said the next one would be a 
so that if a guy made any money, he couldn't keep it. The next one would be inheritance tax. So if he had any property, he couldn't give it to the next generation. It would have to be given back to the bank, which is controlled by the government, which is controlled by the bank. The fourth platform was a confiscation of all property of rebels. A rebel is identified as anyone who doesn't pay the first two taxes. You've heard of tax rebel? It's not a new term, is it? You see? Okay, the fifth platform was that there would be a central bank. In other words, they, the boys would have to go in and print the money. It wouldn't be printed from inside the country. And to spare you the agony, I'll just go down to the tenth platform, that the government would run all schools. Isn't that interesting? That was the platform, okay? It was sent over there, and there was a fellow named uh, Engels who was the head of the, the uh, Rothschild Bank in Vienna, in, in Austria. And uh, he had a son by the name of Frederick, and so they said, well, look, we'll have this guy write this up, introduce it in England, and we'll call it the Communist Manifesto. Isn't that interesting? So the bank produced their document to confiscate all land, and they said, first of all, it has to look like it's not a bank. So they said, okay, we want to make it look like it's a popular movement, okay? But they said, well, it still doesn't look like a popular movement because this guy's the banker's kid. And they said, aha, what we need is some guy that can put this over. So in 1867, the first manuscript that ever came along with Karl Marx's name on it. Isn't that interesting? And now Karl Marx is credited with having written the document. He wrote that document about as much as he wrote the LA phone book. Okay? He just simply put his name on it because they needed a diversion. They needed a distraction to show that this was not a bank repossessing property. This was actually uh, a, hippie, a hippie movement, if you will, of people that just wanted to own everything in common. Oh, really? <laughs> interesting. All right. From 1867 until 1913, every year the income tax was introduced in the United States. And every year it failed. 66 years go by. Every year income tax failed, income tax failed, income tax failed. Finally, the Supreme Court in 1895 said, look, even if the income tax passes in the United States, it can't pass because it's a direct tax. See, what happened here was back in the days of our founding times here, our, our, our fathers in their wisdom did some interesting things. And they said that they realized that they had, uh, oh, 13 separate countries over here. They had Connecticut, Vermont, Rhode Island, Virginia, Delaware, New York, and ring. And so, historically, these countries would have problems if they didn't have some type of a central government here uh, to stop the smuggling, to make sure there were no trade embargoes, and so forth. So they realized that there had to be some regulation uh, from inside. Now, the problem is they did not want this government to be the sovereign. They said, we want the sovereign up here, okay? We want the sovereign, or the ruler, as Solomon says, to be the citizens in the states. Now, how could you make it so that the government now, in other words, if this were the citizens, how could you make it so that the government was the servant? And this is the kind of government they gave us. And they said, okay, the, what we have to do is make sure that the servant cannot tax a master. So that's one of the conditions, that the servant cannot tax the master. And they said, well, how are we going to fund this government? And they said, aha, it's going to be an indirect tax or a transactional tax, and you can tax transactions, such as business and sales. But you can't tax a master in his income or his property. Isn't that interesting? And so they had written in the Constitution that they could tax on excise, imposts, tariffs, duties, and these things. They're enumerated. What, what is a legal tax, you see? Notice income tax is not there. We're up to 1913 or up to 1912, income tax doesn't show up, okay? And so when the Supreme Court came along and said, look, you guys are trying to pass a tax from the master on, from the servant on the master. And even if you did it, the Supreme Court's going to throw it out. So back to the drawing board. These guys were busy, 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 because, hey, there's nothing more profitable than running a country like the United States. So they had plenty of time, plenty of money to put this together. So they said, what we need to do then is change the Constitution. We have to change that aspect so it's okay for the servant to tax his master. They introduced it in 1913 as the 16th Amendment. They couldn't get anybody hardly to do it. They finally passed it through four state legislatures, but they had control by that time of the school system and they had control of the news media, so nobody knew it. There's a book out called The Law That Never Was by William Benson. William Benson has been imprisoned. He's been given drugs. He's been brutally tortured in an Illinois prison. Probably, I don't know if he's still alive or not, but it, his, it, the, the publishing of this book cost him his life in 1990. We're not talking 1763. We're talking 1990. 
the boys don't like it when you publish this information. They get mad. See? All right? And he showed that the law was never ratified by more than four state legislatures. And it was supposed to have been ratified by, I don't know, 18 or 19. Didn't quite make it, did it? But we don't know it because we get the news that they want us to get and we go to the schools that they want us to go to. And that's where we get our information. Is this fun or what? And they got Waltons and Daltons all tied up. You can't get anything in the bookstores, okay? Okay, interesting stuff. Okay, this was a con job right from the start, con job. Now, once we understand that that's what income tax is, now we're ready to cope with it. Okay, it's an illegal thing. It's, it, didn't even, it doesn't even exist. <coughs> Thank you, misspelled sovereign? Good reason. There's me in here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So they tried to get the income tax in. They couldn't get it in for 66 years now, every year. Now, the problem was that they had these senators that didn't want to... Uh, pass this the Senate wouldn't pass it see now we have to first of all take a look at the 17th amendment okay because the 17th amendment is the election of senators in the original constitution of Constitution for America one it said that okay if you wanted to have a the senator was the was the uh, control that a state legislature had on the federal government okay and for 66 years the state governments kept sending their guy to Washington and say no we don't want a federal income tax why would, why would, why would uh, Louisiana or why would Ohio want a, a federal income tax? So they kept blowing this thing out of the water, you see. And so they said, okay, what we have to do is change the representation of the Senate. Now they call it the direct election of the senators. I mean, direct election of senators certainly sounds good, doesn't it? But let's take a look at what it really is, okay? My dad, wisdom wise that he was, when, when I was in high school and I got my first job, he says, I'd like to explain something to you. So this is a paycheck. And he says, the employee receives the paycheck, okay? And this is the amount. And he says it's signed by the boss. He says, it's a really very simple system. He says, if you want another paycheck, you just make this guy happy. But his job is not to make you happy. He says, you have any problems? He says, remember that. He says, because you're there for his benefit. He's not there for yours. Got the picture? That's the relationship between a boss and a, an employee. Now, before 1917, okay, the employee was the U.S. Senator. And the boss was the state legislature. So if the state had something going on in the federal it didn't like, it would have the senator cancel it. Isn't that interesting? In 1917, they changed bosses. From, 19, from 1913, I'm sorry, from 1913 on, it's no longer the state legislature, it's the federal government. The senator no longer represents the state government, he represents the federal government. That's why when you write your state senator, like Red Cranston, we call him Red Cranston, because that's not the color of his hair, but that's the color of his voting record. Okay, what happens here? is that he always explains to you why he votes the way you don't want him to vote. He never really says, oh, yes, that's the way I should do it. He has not voted for the benefit of California. He's voted for the benefit, for the benefit of, the, of the central bank ever since he's been there. He knows, what the, he knows where, the, where the bread's buttered. And the state, for the last 80 years, has had no representation at all. It's totally powerless. Isn't that interesting? You see, they, this had to happen before they could get an income tax. The second thing they did was they had to change the 16th Amendment, which said, okay, now, now you can have a direct tax. Now it's okay for the, for the servant to tax his master. Well, if the, if the servant can tax his master, you've just had a role reversal, haven't you? You've just had a change of master, that's all. That's interesting, isn't it? See, that's like the old Aesop's fable about the donkey, that the guy was going off and he's leaving the donkey, he's selling the farm and left the donkey, and he says, well... He says, I suppose you're glad to get rid of me, huh? And the donkey says, well, it doesn't make any difference. He says, change of ownership doesn't mean freedom. See, isn't that interesting? We just had a change of ownership, didn't we? All right? So these two things happened along with a third thing in 1913. Very bad year. Very bad year. They introduced the Federal Reserve System. The Federal Reserve System is simply a central bank. And now the United States government will go into debt to private individuals unnamed and unknown. Well, there was a book written called uh, Secrets of the Federal Reserve back in the 50s by a fellow named Eustace Mullins, probably the finest book on the, on the market as to the Federal Reserve System. Uh, Mullins went in and he found out who owned the Federal Reserve System. I won't go into a big, long story on it. It was interesting. But the Federal Reserve System is 52% owned, 52% owned by the Rothschild Bank. Isn't that interesting? Out of London. 
guess we'll start again. I wonder if they got other colors. <laughs> what do we got here? We'll try a couple more here. Let's see what we got. We got green and red. Let's try that. Okay. <clears throat> okay, that's 50. Now, meanwhile, you have some other things here. Here's 52% that's owned by, or sorry, 24%, excuse me. 24%. There's more, we've got more red ones here too. Okay, 24% owned by the, uh, by the by people in the United States, and it's 24% owned by people in Europe. Okay, according to Mullins, okay, there are four families that own uh, money, a property that own part of it in the United States. This is the uh, uh, this is the uh, Goldman Sachs Bank. These are banking families. They're not person. They're not physical families, but they're they call themselves banking families. The Goldman Sachs Bank. You've got the uh, the Lehman Brothers Bank. You've got uh, the Kuhn Loeb Bank, and you've got the uh, Rockefeller Brothers. Now, over in Europe, you've got uh, three families. Okay, you have the Ferrars, the uh, I forget what this E R E R or R E R E. But anyway, Ferrars Brothers. You've got the Moses Israel Seif out of Rome. This is this is France. This is Italy. And then out of Hamburg in Germany, you have the Warburg brothers. Isn't that interesting? Germany. Okay. And the Netherlands. Okay, this is the stock ownership uh, of the Federal Reserve System. That's who the owners are. Now, we often get some information that, for example, the Rockefellers are, are dirty guys and bad guys, and that they really are causing problems in this country. And... Uh, Let's take a look at that. See, the Rockefellers own approximately, I would say, 6%. All these guys own about 6%, something like this. These guys own about 8%, according to my calculations. And this guy owns 52%. Okay, ready? Here's the biggie question. Okay, ready? Question of the day. Who makes the decisions? Interesting, isn't it? Who's the errand boy? Who's the messenger boy that carries it out? And we're, we're fed this guy as the real problem. It takes the heat off all the others, doesn't it? Notice, notice, you kill the, the messenger boy, you really don't kill the message, do you? <laughs> okay, interesting stuff. Okay, here is the ownership of the Federal Reserve's bank. These are the boys who make all the money. The interest on the national debt is paid to them. Is this fun? How would you like to receive the interest on the national debt? Is this, think that'd be a good business? Notice that this organization has never been audited and it never produces an annual report. <laughs> they don't got to show you no stinking bodges. Isn't this fun? If you don't pay them, they come and get your house. It's called IRS, because that's the name of their collection agency. We now understand taxes to some extent. Okay? Now, uh, I don't have time. Let's see. What are, what are we going here? I guess, can we, what, how, what much time have we got in this hour? Is this close to an hour? Let's take a break. We're going to come back, and we're going to show you a little bit of history from the Civil War, or from the 1913 on to the present, as far as you know, the economics are concerned. And then we're going to show you how to really solve this problem by going into showing you how they set it up. There's two ways, there's two things. Just like I gave you a tip last time for the next hour. Okay, the tip to the next hour now, two words. There's two ways you will never, ever have any problem with IRS. And that is never have an income and never have any assets. Now, what we're going to show you is that all these families here in the United States have no income and they have no assets. It's called trust. So come back next week, next hour. Trust me, you'll enjoy this. <laughs> All right. So what? I got to read read the script from the bank. <laughs> okay. So what we had? You guys are going to get tired of hearing this. <laughs> okay. We had Paul Warburg running the Federal Reserve System in the United States. His brother Sidney running the Citibank in England, and his brother Max getting ready to run the city, the bank over in Germany, the, Re the Reichsbank, but at that time, before World War I, he was just simply the head of the British Secret Service, which is the position George Bush had before he was president over here. <laughs> well, moving right along. Okay, we find that there's a connection between the, the int intelligence services and the banks uh, because it's imperative that the bank uh, be able to run the government. It runs it through these intelligence services. If you want to read Spycatcher, <coughs> an excellent book by Peter... Uh, uh, gosh, what's his name now? I can't think of his name. P. 
Peter Wright, okay, who was the, uh, the number two man in M British intelligence MI5 for 14 years, wrote a book and said that uh, his key contact during that period of time was a fellow named Victor Rothschild, and that, uh, that the, all of the, all of the, uh, the knowledge that, that MI5 would develop instantly went to the KGB in Russia. He couldn't figure out how that happened because all he told was Victor Rothschild. <laughs> And he was banned. He can't even come back to England. His pension was stolen. The Queen has a warrant for his arrest, and he's in Australia or something now. Uh, another book called uh, A Man Called Intrepid by uh, William Stevenson about how Roosevelt was entirely run by British intelligence before and during World War II. Every speech was cleared. Every, everything he said was, was cleared through British intelligence, and, and, the, and the scripts were written by them before Roosevelt said anything. So we find that uh, through the banks, the... Uh, or by the banks and through the intelligence services, the, the banks run the governments. It's extremely interesting to understand that. And of course, our friend George Bush has had some experience of that. All right. Now, and so I don't want to overlook that point. <laughs> uh, George is one of the boys. Okay. Now, so what they had to do is they had to get into Russia. So they had a fellow over here named Trotsky. Okay. Leon Trotsky. Trotsky uh, uh, had some, uh, that was not his real name. His real name was something else. I forget what it was. Anyway, he had, it was some New York name, okay? <laughs> it was not Russian, okay? What he had was a bunch of hoodlums that he'd, that he'd recruited out of the east side over in New York, and he, he, and they all changed their name to Russian, and then they went over in a boat with 20 millions of dollars from uh, Jacob Schiff, who was the senior partner of uh, Kuhn Loeb Bank, and they started the, they met in uh, what was called Petrograd, which is today called Leningrad, and I guess they're going to change that again, but anyway, uh, with a fellow named uh, 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 Lenin, okay? Now, Lenin had come up uh, had come from Germany, of course, uh, initially, and he was he was given six million dollars by Sidney Warburg from the British Bank through Alfred Milner. But anyway, uh, so what I want to point out is these banks entirely set up the conflict uh, that led to communism in, in Russia, and uh, so they went over and they started the Communist Party, and then they decided they'd have a little meeting with the Tsar. So the Tsar got together with his house, family ring, and they went in and they machine gunned the entire Romanov family, uh, and that's how you end a blood feud. <laughs> no problem. From then on. Uh, they had a red star in Russia, and the Rothschild flew from the mast, and it's been there ever since. All right, and the United States completely supported that with our tax money because the taxes started in 1913, and they couldn't start world communism until four years later. Somebody had to pay for it, you see, because communism is a defunct form of government. It can't produce anything. It is a parasite, and it's an interesting thing if you're into parasitology. A parasite has two things that he has to do. He has to make the host think that he's necessary, you see, and then also... Uh, he uh, has to uh, make the host ill. He has to make the host sick, so the host is unable to dislodge him. And next hour we'll talk about the AMA, okay, and things like that. Okay, because we see that the food industry in this country and the water industry is not here to make us well, is it? Uh, uh, a sick host is always easier to control. The parasite requires his host to be ill. And so we run around with all these things, with Anison constantly being advertised on TV and all this garbage, and uh, we're just, uh, you know, health is something we're really not into until some guys think it's in LA are, but that's that's about it. The rest of the world isn't too interested is back to the meat and potatoes and fluoridation. All right. I mean it does kill germs, it also kills rats. <laughs> okay. So you'll have good teeth on your skeleton. <laughs> okay. Nothing wrong with that. Okay, who wants to die with bad teeth? Okay, so we have Trotsky went over and started this whole nonsense over there. And so we find that, of course, it was, it was set up the entire uh, thing in Russia and so forth. I just wanted to show you how the banking sets all this up. I think we can go into lots of details. There's, at the end of the, of the program here, I think Guy is going to go into some of the books that are available. The best books that I know of, the three best books that I'd recommend reading are, number one, The Unseen Hand by Ralph Epperson. It gives you a great panorama. See, it's necessary before you get into the specifics to see the whole panorama, just to know what part of this canyon are you in now, you know, when you read some little specific item, okay? Then the next, the next book I would recommend reading would be uh, Secrets of the Federal Reserve by Eustace Mullins. And uh, then there's a little pamphlet back there called uh, Billions for the Bankers. It only takes a few minutes to read it. Kind of gives you a quick picture. Um, you know, if you just have a little bit of time, the, the, uh, the Unseen Hand will take you a long time to read. But it's, it's, uh, it's very uh, profitable reading. You'll understand a lot more after you finish it. There, then there's about 200 other books that we have in a book list that once you, once you read those, then you kind of have the overview. You can see what area you're interested in and go for it. Different people are interested in different areas, you know. 
And uh, so those are the, that's kind of what I would say for an overview. Okay, uh, then of course we had World War I and then we had World War II. When World War I, of course, got Russia into the communist fold and uh, put all the eastern banks, which were not too subservient to the Rothschild, and it, that was the result of World War II, was we went in and we, made, we gave all the eastern European countries to uh, the Rothschild Bank after World War II, and the United States comes back. The United States now has a function. Uh, uh, if you go back to, it's interesting, if you really go back into the roots of this thing, uh, you go back into the Talmud, which was, a, which was written in, in Babylon, strangely enough, in the year 1040. Uh, <coughs> I don't know if there's a coincidence there or if that's just another plan. Okay. But anyway, uh, and it, it, it says that, uh, of course, the Gentiles, which are your non-Jewish uh, uh, people, were just dogs. They're just, they're, they're just the slaves and so forth, and they're to, to work for their master. And, and I have dogs. I have, I have a German Shepherd, very nice dog, and he goes with me everywhere. And his job is to protect his master, and he does a good job. The job of the United States now is to protect its master. So wherever its master has problems, whether it's Iran, Vietnam, or Korea, wherever, we go there and protect our master. Isn't that interesting? Our master is the Federal Reserve System. The United States is, is the colonial army for the Bank of London. And we've been the colonial army for the Bank of London since 1913. If you don't understand our foreign policy, that's uh, because you don't understand banking. You see, the policy isn't really all that foreign. <laughs> it, it's actually bank policy not foreign policy, and we go wherever the bank wants us to go. So wherever the boys with the bank have a little need, uh, well, then our boys go and we die and we bleed for that need. Is this now we understand the military. Uh, it's, it's too bad. The reason that we're talking about it is because maybe if more people know something about it, we can solve the problem. Okay? Now, so that's, uh, now that we discussed the military, we discussed World War I, we discussed World War II, Korea, Vietnam, so forth. Somebody is making some money or it simply doesn't happen. Okay, now, so what we see was that in 1913, a switch was made. We switched from the Constitution to the Manifesto. Uh, your senators here, your congressmen, uh, some of them are exceptions, of course, have generally voted entirely for the Manifesto. They will not make any decision accidentally in favor of the Constitution at any time. Okay? And so it's important that we understand this, because we want to know which country our representative is representing us to. You see, because if he's representing us to America too, well, there isn't much point. And if he's not representing us to America one, and he doesn't know anything about it, then we should either tell him or get somebody in who does know something about it, because that's where the solution uh, comes also. But it comes from within us. The solution doesn't come from out there, and it doesn't come from them. It comes from you, and it comes from me. And it's tremendous, this power, you see. And tremendous power. This is the, the power which enables David to kill Goliath. This is the the ultimate solution to all problems is as soon as you can do it, then you'll take care of it. Reminds me of the Aesop fable of the, the sparrows that were in the field. And the, the mother came back one day and the bird said, oh, they were all excited that, that the, the farmer was out with all of his neighbors and they were going to mow the field and they'd have to go. And the mother bird says, no, don't worry, we, we're safe. And so about a week later, the birds came back and they said, well, you know, it's really, the farmer was out here with his sons and they said that they were going to come back tomorrow and and, and, and mow the field. And the mother said, no, uh, we're not going to worry about that. Uh, don't worry. And uh, so the next week, uh, the farmer came out, and, or the birds, the, the little bird said, mother, and the farmer came out, and he said, and he was all alone. He says, well, tomorrow he's going to come out and cut the field. And she says, now, she says, children, we have to move. <laughs> you see, as long as the farmer was relying on someone else to do it, it would never get done. <laughs> That's probably a 3,000-year-old story, okay? It's just as true then as it is today, okay? If you're waiting for somebody else to do it, it ain't going to happen. You're just kidding yourself, okay? If you decide you're going to do it, aha, then something will get done, okay? And that's the story of human nature. All right, so what we're going to be talking about here is some information, hopefully, that can be given to you that will enable something for you to do, okay? And something for me to do. This is what I do. You may do something else, okay? <laughs> oh, we got markers. Uh, Doug, try to erase markers, bullet point, okay? All right. Well, let's take a look at this now. <clears throat> when the Communist Manifesto came in, it was the, the exact opposite of the Constitution because it abolished private property. And it, uh, of course, did this through taxes and inflation. Okay, and we drew the chart showing the taxes and inflation when we started exactly what's happening. So it's kind of irrefutable that this is happening. Okay, now, what do we do to protect ourselves against this? Okay, the taxes and the inflation basically hit anybody who owned private property. 
Okay? So anybody who owns private property... Oh, this is great. Anybody who owns private... Well, let's start over. Okay, so <laughs> anybody who owns private property, okay, will have a problem. <laughs> All right. Now, here's how the boys in the bank, when they introduced the income tax in 1913, by 1908, from 1905 to 1908, they solved all of their problems. Because by the time their program was implemented in 1913, they didn't, listen, this is, write this down, they didn't have any income and they didn't have any assets. How can you do that? Well, I was careful. I remember my daughter when she was in school and she came home in the second grade, she was all excited. She said she learned some magic. And I said, really? And she said, yeah, she's, uh, what, 34 now, I guess, and she's got her master's degree. She works as a, a pretty important job. But uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, when she was in second grade, she came home and she learned this, this magic thing. She goes, look at this. She goes, da 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 I thought, hmm, that's really good, see? And so she says, not only that, but, watch this, and she had a whole bunch of She goes, da 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 Okay, now, okay, we have just, we have just described central banking. That's all you need to know about central banking. Okay. How do you make ownership so it's not ownership? It's magic. Watch. It's called trust. What does a trust do? A trust makes it so you don't own the property. Now let me ask you, would you rather own your car or drive your car? Which would you rather do? Because drive means you're in control. See, somebody once said the definition of a pedestrian is someone who has a teenage child. Well, all right, so notice what happens. See, owning the car doesn't do you any good if the car is never home. <laughs> so ownership really isn't where it's at. It's you want to control the car, right? So watch the dichotomy. There is a dichotomy between ownership and control. Control you want. Ownership, nah, it's just a problem. Liabilities and a lot of work, see? So the ownership of your property now is called... Your, whatever property you have goes into what the Latin term here is for corpus, means body. So you have a body, and you grant or create, you are the creator or the grantor here, and you grant this corpus into a trust. Now, that means that you're going to have two trustees of a minimum of two trustees. So you're going to have trustee one, you've got to have trustee two, okay? And you've got to have some type of a beneficiary. Now, we won't get into all what can be who or anything here, because that's another, another story, another hour, okay? Now, what you've done here is that you have just divested yourself of ownership. You don't own anything anymore. You say, well, that's fine, but I didn't work for my stuff just so I could give it away, right? Okay, so what we want to do now is have the creator come over here. Remember we talked about Oliver Cromwell? He said, we don't want a king in England, we want a protector. Well, under English law, you have what's called a protector. The protector now of a trust, all he does is hire and fire trustees. That's all he does. Now. Uh, the protector also has you as the manager, possibly here, and you in turn have other agents and so forth, and all you do is you write the checks and decide where the money's spent, okay? That's all. Okay, notice that what we have over here is control. Isn't that interesting? Over here we have ownership, okay? So what you do by setting up a trust is you divest yourself of the ownership, but you retain control. Are we having fun? You now drive the thing, you just don't have to pay the bills. <laughs> it's like being a kid all over again, remember? Okay. <laughs> all right. What you do is you divest yourself of the control. Now, the, the income tax doesn't apply to control. <laughs> Nobody has to pay an inheritance tax when he controls something. It's only when he owns something. Now, who owns the trust? And the answer is nobody. It's in trust. Now listen, this takes da 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 Ready? This takes some real deep understanding. <laughs> when this thing is in trust, nobody owns it. Because it's being held for somebody. Now, when the trust buys a piece of property for 100000 and it sells it for 100000 it doesn't have any capital gains tax because it didn't own the property. Are we having fun? <laughs> Get it? No tax. No tax. Look, Mom, no tax, okay? This is hot. This is hot. There is no tax because there is no ownership. This is what the boys did in 1908 before they took in their manifesto as to replace the Constitution in 1913. 
This is the antidote. If you're ever out in the woods, you get poison oak or something, there's always an oak tree. If you take off the bark of the oak tree and there's sap on the inside, that's the antidote to the, to the, to the stuff that burns your skin. And it will, it will neutralize the burn that the leaf gives you. Is this fun? See, because the leaf really is an oak. The leaf is a little plant. What the oak is, the next to it, that's what cures it. Are we having fun? See, there's always in nature an antidote for every problem. Okay, the antidote to taxes is trust. Okay? Now, they did something else, too. Okay? That's the first thing. We won't go into it anymore here, uh, except that towards the end, I'll explain what our program is and, and how it works. And I think Guy's got another program that runs along. Hey, you know, free country, free world here, okay? But, uh, and you, you, can, you can do kind of whatever you want to on that score, but where you can see somebody else. You know, you don't have to deal with us. All we want to do is give you the information to put you in control. That's all. Okay, this is not too good. <laughs> Should come off. Okay, there we go. I like the color, though. That's a neat color. Okay. Now, the other thing he did was he said, okay, if you have a job, okay, what they did here, they said, if you've got a job, for example, okay, you have what's called a gross income, and that's where the term comes from because it's usually pretty gross. <laughs> and then you have your tax withheld and, and then you have your net. So if you make $50,000 in a job or your family makes $50,000, you'll have about 32000 of it missing because that's your money withheld. Oh, excuse me, excuse me, 18000 with missing. Excuse me. You have about 18000 of this missing. Okay, which represents about 40% of your paycheck missing and you end up with 32000 this is, I've just described to you the average guy in L.A. in the year 1991. Okay? Now, that's, that's what income tax does and, and Social Security does to this guy. Okay? He's, he's pretty soon going to be up in the 60% missing and the 70%. And I think Sweden's already in 80% or, you know, hear all these stories. This guy's locked in. He doesn't know that he's in control. If he doesn't know he's in control, then he's not. Okay, what they did was they, they set up another thing over here called business. This is important because this is, what, this is what got business to back the income tax in 1913 after it wouldn't back it for 66 years. Why would business back it? Why would business be in favor of income tax? It doesn't make any sense. Aha, and thus we know more. Okay, what they did was they said, okay, you've got a gross income here, and now you deduct your expenses, and then you end up with your net, and then you pay your tax. Okay? In the flow goes something like that. Okay, notice there is one big difference between a business and a job, isn't there? And that is an extra box. One has four boxes and one has three boxes. This is a test. Okay, now, if the businessman, what's the value of the box? Well, if the businessman makes $50,000, on paper he will spend $50,000, won't he? It does not hard. You don't have to lose the money. You just trade it from cash to some property or some, some type of an asset. And the, trans the, the transfer of, of property from one form to another is a deduction, isn't it? You don't have to lose it. Just transfer it. <laughs> Donald Trump, can I do that? He's got this divorce coming, so he's transferring out. Poor guy's broke. You see, all of a sudden? Okay? <laughs> so he didn't lose his property. He's transferring it, isn't he? He's not stupid. <laughs> he's just having a divorce. Okay, now. <laughs> okay, now his net, so the net here is zero and the tax is zero, isn't it? Now, which group would you rather be in? Take your time. <laughs> okay, see, notice what we're learning here, okay? This guy not only can keep all his money, he gets to spend it and he pays no tax. This guy only gets 60% of it and he's taxed on 100% of it. <laughs> he's, look at it, he's taxed the money he doesn't even get. But he thinks this is a great deal because he's been to school and he's adjusted. <laughs> what does that mean? That means that his employer takes out $20,000, you see, and when he files his tax, he's only got $18,000 to pay, and Joe Lunchbucket gets a $2,000 refund. Is he happy? Oh, ecstatic. That is a week in Hawaii with his wife. And he's happy. He can hardly wait till next year. <laughs> So if you, go, if you go to the mall with your little clipboard and you ask people if they've got tax problems, you're going to find out they're going to say, oh, no, last year we got some back. 
That is adjustment. That's totally adjusted, okay? Now, what, what, what it takes to, to illustrate this is a story I think I read in the paper one time about a fellow back in Tennessee who had gone hunting. He had been hunting and he couldn't, he'd, he'd got lost. It was in the fall, the year was beginning to snow, and he couldn't find his way home, he couldn't find anything to eat, he couldn't find water, he was in terrible shape. So at the end of the fourth day, he, he, as this account went in the newspaper, he cut off his dog's tail and he made soup. And, and while he was eating the soup, the dog came over and looked rather mournful, so he gave the dog some of the soup. And he said that out of gratitude, the dog licked his hand. And I thought, that's it. That's, that's the closest thing I can think of to actually having a tax refund. Okay, so what we did, so what we did, so what we did is we thought, well, we'd have a, <laughs> so we thought we'd put a seminar together and show people how to re retain their entire anatomy every payday. Okay, now, and so you see, if a guy, if a guy is happy with the system, it means one thing, he doesn't understand it. Either that or he's got a degree. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Now, so, so what we found here was that, uh, that the average guy gets up and, okay, leaves his house here, he leaves his home at point A in the morning, okay, and he drives to point B, you know, which is his work, and then at 4.30 he comes back again. Ever notice this? Murphy has some new laws out. He says, if you're a commuter, for example, he said, the lane you're in will be the slowest lane. And his corollary to that is unless you should change lanes. Okay, now, so what happens here is that this guy does this every day now, 40, 40 hours a week, and after 40 hours every week, he's broke. So what does he do? What's his response? Next week he does the same thing. I mean, like this guy really doesn't catch on that this is not the solution to his problem. Okay, 40 years later, this guy's still doing this, okay? So we call it the 40-40 plan because he's broke after 40 hours every week, and after 40 years he gets to be broke permanently. <laughs> it's never dawned on him, this isn't the solution to his problem. Because <laughs> he's adjusted, you see? Now. And, and there are some fringe benefits, like two weeks out of every year, this guy can go about 150 miles from home because that's where his nearest relative is and that's all the money he has, okay? <laughs> then he comes back and he repeats this process for another 50 weeks. Is this guy happy? Mm-hmm. Very happy, see? So we thought, well, how could we explain this? So, so we got, some people call this the rat race, you know? So we, we thought, well, we'll get some hamsters, put them in there, see what happens. So we did some surveys and we found that, say, an interesting thing, that if we put a hamster in a cage, he does exactly the same thing. He runs around in his little wheel. So the only difference we discovered, by the way, was we found if we ever let this little guy out for two weeks, he never came back. <laughs> and so, so we thought, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what we were able to learn from our experiments is that apparently one of the species is more intelligent. <laughs> And we, and we thought, well, now what really, really, what is the difference? What is the difference between this guy and this guy? And it came up, this guy's been to school. <laughs> He's adjusted. This guy's not adjusted. You see the problem? See? So, <laughs> so we, have to, we have to triumph over our adjustment here, okay? Now, so what we're talking about is that this guy never really realizes this is available over here, okay? So if we look at it more closely now, see if we can get this erased. Not easy, working on it. Okay, is that about 95% of the people in the country, as Guy was talking about, is, are over here and only 5% are over here. Isn't that interesting? See, because only 5% of the people know about this. You see, I have a lot of fun with trust. See, because every time you present a trust somebody, this guy's gonna come up, well, if you can do this, how come everybody doesn't do it? And I'll say, you know, that's a very good, you know, being a salesman, don't you? that's an excellent question, sir. That's an excellent question, sir. Tell me. Why didn't you do this last week? <laughs> and he says, oh, I didn't know about it. He says, you just answered your own question. You just answered your own question. Nobody knows about it. Okay. See, and that's the answer. Because in all of the schooling, in all of the news media, in all of the publications, this is never mentioned because the Federal Reserve System doesn't like it. Got it? And if it doesn't like it, you don't see it. But aren't you glad we don't have censorship in this country? Whew. Oh boy, you see? This thing is run entirely for the benefit of our lender. This is not good for the lender, and that's why you don't learn it. Okay? Now, how we get out of this thing is we learn some things. Is this fun? We learn some things. Okay? Now, remember Paul Warburg back there? He said, well, we're going to set up two kinds of people, guys of business, guys of jobs. Okay. What he did was he designed two kinds of forms. Okay? So we're learning that there's two kinds of people. There's a business, and there is a job. Okay? Now, what is the difference, basically? Well, let's take a look at this. 
First of all, we're going to define what a business is. And I like to be very basic in my definitions. It reminds me of the football coach. Every spring practice, he'd hold, the first thing he would do every spring practice out in the field, he'd hold up a football. And he'd say, gentlemen, this is a football. And finally, one guy showed up in the last row, and he said, hold it, coach. He said, not so fast. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to try not to go too fast this morning. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, what is a business? Okay, okay. now I'm, I'm going to spare you the agony of my opinions. I'm not even going to read what Webster says because we don't care. Here's what the Congress tells us a business is because it writes the, IRS, the Internal Revenue Code, the IRC. See, so notice this, Internal Revenue Code equals law. Okay, it's written by Congress. It's important to understand these things. IRS represents an interpretation, okay? And it's called regulation. Get the difference? That's what they think the law says, but it's, they're not sure because it hasn't been to court yet. <laughs> they don't want their definitions to go to court because it may change. Because they make most of their money down here. They don't make it up here. Now, the reason that a tax, uh, that a, okay, you've heard of tax attorneys, you can't even find them in the yellow page, who are tax attorneys? Well, tax attorneys work for corporations, and they tell the president how to operate up here. You don't want to work by IRS opinion, you're going to come out on the short end of the stick, aren't you? But yet, all we ever see in H&R block classes, we call it preparation H&R, okay, and all these things, what, all, all you hear is that they teach this. They're really not teaching this. You see? Now, in order to be free, you've got to know what the truth is. That's what Jesus said. Show the truth, truth to make you free, okay? You didn't know he was talking about IRS, did you? Okay, now, so what happens here is he was way ahead of his time. <laughs> okay, so what happens here is that, yes, we have to go back to the source. We have to see what in the world are these definitions, because we know what Orwell says, that, you know, a definition benefits the, the, the powers that be. Remember, if you, if you print the money, it's called counterfeiting, and if, if, if the bank prints it, it's called inflation. See, the definition is not what's being done, it's who's doing it. <laughs> oh boy, he calls this double speak or double think. See, and, and he was a dyed in the world communist or a socialist, okay? And he said, now listen, it's important where Orwell's coming from because he's not a very positive type of guy. He said on his deathbed that the, the history of man or the future of man, because he, he, he didn't believe there's any solution to this, the history of man under socialism is a man's face with a boot on it. And that's the hist that's what we have to look forward to. That's what he had to look forward to. Well, thankfully, he didn't know anything, okay? Because I don't think he'd ever read the Bible, okay? But, you see, that's what you look at when you just look at what IRS says. Because that's exactly what they're talking about, okay? We're going to go to the law. And we're going to talk about the difference here between the two later on here. Okay, remember, the regulation is just simply their interpretation. Well, I can have my, I could have actually print a regulation and go and say, here's what my regulation says. It'd be just as good as theirs, wouldn't it? Because neither one of them went through Congress. <laughs> Get it? Now, the world is living under this interpretation, and it's wrong. And many, most of the time, it's wrong. Okay? So, in the, in the, going under the law now, going under the law, the law says that a business, as any endeavor, has a profit motive and economic activity. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that, you, that you're trying to make money and you either spent some money or you made some money or both. Well, that's not too hard. Now, the regulation comes along. Now, what they're saying now in the regulation for, are, are the things like you have to make a profit three out of five years. Well, notice the law doesn't say that. And as a result, we see some interesting things. Lockheed, for example, hasn't made a net profit since 1938. IRS has not declared it a hobby. <laughs> See, you say, how can that be? Well, they have a tax department, and they know what they operate under the America 1, which is the law. America 2 is the regulation. Get the picture? Which country do you want to belong to? It's up to you. The control comes from within you, but the education system is designed to make it so you don't have the option, because if you don't ever hear of anything, you don't have the option. A guy named Perry once said it's impossible to be ignorant and free at the same time. Because, because if you don't know what, what the options are, you can't be free. <laughs> the, 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 the public education countries make sure you have no options. Okay? Now, if I taught this class over here at USC, well, I'd be thrown out because the function of that college president is to make sure no education occurs on the premises, isn't it? That's his job. What college president has ever been fired because the education was poor? 
I mean, it's only if it's too much, right? <laughs> if he's radical, you see, that's too much information. Shows up as radical, rad, rad. Okay, okay. So they operate on these regulations. Well, okay, we don't want to operate for United Airlines, for example. I, this is incredible. United Airlines, okay, since 1947 has not made a profit. Here we're talking what 40 what 44 years. These guys have been operating an airline in the red. How can you operate for 44 years an airline doesn't make any money? The answer is, Joe Lunchbucket gives them his taxes. It's called a subsidy. Well, you'd think these guys were friendly, wouldn't you? Okay, so notice what we're learning here. See, these guys have been running this airline on other people's money. Well, hey, it's called taxes, you see. Now, here's the thing. I flew down yesterday on Pan Am. Pan Am's an interesting airline. Pan Am, now listen, is being bought by United. <laughs> now, how can a company has made money for 40 years, four years buy another airline? <laughs> <laughs> Some things they didn't teach us at Harvard, huh? Get the picture? These boys don't ever operate at a profit. That's the last thing you ever want to do. Isn't that fun? Got it? Okay, because if they got a profit, they simply buy another airline. <laughs> Whoops, in the red again. <laughs> well, more subsidies. <laughs> See? And this is where our money goes. This is incredible. Okay, now, profit motive economic activity. All right, let's take a look at this now, because there's two forms, one for the guy with the business and one for the guy with the job, because these forms were invented by Paul Warburg. If you take a look at the first form in 1913, it's, it's totally intelligible. You can recognize it instantly because it looks so much like the form in 1990s and also the form in the 2000s and the form in 2003 when all private property would be confiscated except for the 5%. Because that's what it's coming down to. You got your choice. Which boat do you want to ride on? You want the Titanic or you want the life raft? <laughs> Titanic's a lot more popular. More people on it. <laughs> okay. Do not be in the band. Because they played Nearer My God to Thee as the ship sank. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, what happens here? Okay. You had a form called 1040. Okay. Here's a 1040 form. You've probably seen one before. That was the year the Talmud was written. Oh, get in back. Okay, now, so what happens here? <laughs> you dirty dog. <laughs> now, so what we have here is wages. Okay, $50,000. Okay, if you don't have any adjustments, then the adjusted gross is going to be $50,000. Not too hard to figure out, is it? The reverse side over here goes something like this. You have this $50,000 carried forward, and now you have your deductions. You've got your... Uh, your your uh, exemptions, your, let's say you're married, you got your standard deductions, 5,200. You've got your exemptions, let's say there's four in the family, and there's 20, 50 times four, this changes every year, but you're looking at what, about $9,000 or something like this. Okay, now, you've got $13,200 here that you deduct from your 50,000, which gives you something like uh, 30, what is it, $36,800. And your tax on that now for federal and state is gonna be about $10,000. Not bad, is it? See, that's what the average guy's tax return looks like, something in that area. Okay? Now, if you have a job. Now, if on the other hand you have a business, then you have, an, remember they had an extra box? Well, you, the extra box comes with an extra form. Sort of like Cracker Jacks, you open this box up, boom, another form. And we have here what's called a Schedule C, Schedule D, it's called Schedule E, Schedule F, Schedule K, all these different schedules called Schedule C. Name and address of your business. Hmm, doesn't take long for this to Run out. I think what these pins need to do is sit upright. That would be better. I think there's ink in. It's just at the other end. <laughs> now, um, so we have here uh, income. Okay, here's the income that this business makes. And it has expenses, doesn't it? We have expenses. And we have net. So let's assume you start a business and you actually make $3,000. How much money could you spend? Well, you had the $3,000 from your business you could spend and Theoretically, you had the uh, $50,000 from your job you could spend, right? Because they work together. Now, let's suppose you didn't really spend all of your money. Let's just assume here that you spent, uh, well, let's pick a number at random. Uh, let's say you spent uh, uh, $39,800. And you subtract your three from that, and it's $36,800, isn't it? You had a loss. Is that right? Something like that? Is that right? No, something like that. Okay. I never was good at math. I could never figure it out. I can only figure out taxes. Okay, now, so what we have here is your business now. Okay, your business now, what does it have? It has a loss 
of $36,800. Now, I gotta ask you a quick question. If you made $50,000, is it conceivable you could have spent 36 of it? See, we're not asking you to do anything you didn't do last year, are we? Only we're asking you to account for it differently. Instead of having personal expense, because you remember your Schedule A says personal itemized expenses? Oh, bad. Have Schedule C, business expense. <laughs> the power is in the C. Okay? Don't go to Schedule A. Okay, now, what happens? Okay, this changes. So now what have you got? You got something like $13,200, don't you? Can you see what's coming? Okay, you got $13,200. Now you subtract from that, you're 13200 and that comes out something like zero. And your tax on that is zero. <laughs> da -da 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 got it? It's no more complicated than second grade magic. It's about as complicated as that. And some people won't believe me. We went to a meeting last night in the mortgage meeting. And I loved his approach. He says, some people aren't going to believe you can get an interest-free mortgage. He says, for those of you who don't believe it, we have, we have a plan for you. It's to go out the rest of your life and pay interest. <laughs> See, if you don't believe this, that's fine. Because all that means is that you're going to pay tax the rest of your life. <laughs> that really doesn't do me any harm. But it doesn't make grandkids a lot of harm because you're, you're funding the system that puts them in the funny farm, okay? So to make sure my grandchildren don't have any problem, I'm out here talking to you because the only way my grandchildren be free is if you're free. I got that one figured out. See, it's like a torch. You have to pass it on, see? If I pass this on enough, I can look my grandkids in the eye and say, hey, kid, did it for you. Okay, now, okay, my grandkids, aren't, they're eight and ten. They're not quite sure what I'm doing yet. <laughs> but uh, they will figure it out someday, I hope. Okay, because this is how you pass freedom on, as the Bible says, to your children and your children's children. You're supposed to give an inheritance. What type of inheritance are we giving them with all this debt? It's a negative. You know, one of the most gross uh, anti-family things I've ever seen, and I know it's done in jest, is this bumper sticker, I'm spending my children's inheritance. This is as anti-biblical as you can be, because that's exactly the opposite of God's plan for his creatures. It's exactly the opposite. You see, because this is what happened in Israel in the old days, that they, there was an alienation between the children and their parents, and the whole nation collapsed. And one of the marks of the Messiah, as Malachi talks about, is he's going to restore the fathers to the children. This restoration takes place, you see, because right now we are not only not giving our children anything, we're piling debt on them. I mean, what a horrible thing to do to our children. The worst thing imaginable. I mean, we wouldn't think about going down and getting some poisonous toy for them. We're giving them something worse. You see, and then they make a joke out of it. We're spending their inheritance. Ha ha. It's nauseating. It's just the opposite of what should be going on on the planet. Exactly the opposite, you see. This thing is exactly the opposite of God's plan. You don't know where that comes from. Hey, this comes right out of the pits of hell. I'm totally convinced of it, see? Now, the way that you fight it is you expose it. Two requirements of a conspiracy. It must be secret. It must be illegal. It was against the Constitution. It was secret. Qualifies in my book as a cons conspiracy. Okay. The way that you get rid of it is you illuminate it. You, 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 you expose it. Because it can't exist if it's not secret. Is this fun? It can only exist as long as you don't understand it and your neighbor doesn't understand it, then he'll pay it. See, we call it an ignorance tax. It's really not an income tax. You can make a lot of income and not pay it if you know something. Okay, so here we have this form now, uh, this Schedule C. Let's take a look at it. What kind of expenses could you reasonably expect to take? Okay. Well... If we ever get this board raised, <laughs> we'll get into that subject. Okay, we're going to take a look at certain expenses. Now, there's something like over 200 expenses that you're entitled to if you have a business that you're not entitled to if you don't have a business. You can find these in. You can go down to the, uh, to the stationery store and get a dome book. If, for example, dome puts out a book on business expenses and business support. I mean, th this is not secret and esoteric data. You can find it right down at the store, okay? There are all kinds of things. So let's just go through a half a dozen. For example, you and your spouse probably have a car. Let's assume that your car, uh, uh, you drove your car 15,000 miles, and that your spouse drove the car 15,000 miles. So both of you drove the car 30,000 miles. Now, one of the things important is, is that in 1967, the Supreme Court came down with a decision that said that they could not determine what a part-time business was. Because if you're in a business, you're in a business all the time, because a business is an entity. It's a legal entity. For example, does anyone here go to a part-time church? Do we have any part-time Christians here? See, even if there was a guy here, he wouldn't say anything, would he? Okay. See, <laughs> notice what the assumption is that he's in this all the time, isn't it? Isn't that fun? Because it's illegal. Now, 
marriage. Anybody here in a part? Well, we'll get into that. Okay, now, okay. So the assumption is that if you're married, you're married all the time. That's the legal assumption. Okay? The assumption is of the Supreme Court that if you're in a business, you're in it all the time. And so since 1967, no government publication, no IRS publication has mentioned the word part-time business because th there is no such thing in the eyes of the law. You're either in a business or you're not in a business. Is this fun? You're in a business all the time. You're in a business while you're asleep. Henry Ford goes to Europe. He goes skiing. Does he still write off his plant at Dearborn? Yes, because his presence isn't required. He's not taking that deduction because of where he is. It's who he is. He's not even taking it because of what he's doing. He goes down to Cabo San Lucas for the weekend. Does he write it off? Yeah, he may be doing some business down there someday. <laughs> but because he is a business, he writes it off. Now, naturally, the trip has to do something to the business, so he has to have receipts, he has to have records, and we'll get into that in just a minute. He has to identify that this is, in fact, a business activity. Yeah, question? Oh, you're, you're stretching. Okay. <laughs> Long day. Okay. All right. So what we have here are some interesting things. Okay. That, so now there's 30,000 miles that he and his spouse, or she and his spouse, her spouse, drive, and the gas, what is it, a dollar and a half a gallon now? So there's $4,500 at 10 miles a gallon that this guy can write off because he's got a car. Well, he had a car last year. Put say miles on. Gas may be a little more expensive. But now, not only that, he can depreciate his car, can he? he just, that, that portion that's used for business can depreciate. We're just going to go 100%. Actually, we don't recommend going 90%, but it's too long to go through all the calculations. So we'll just show you quickies here. This is just a real fast one. Depreciation, okay? Let's say his... Okay, same thing. Let's say his, uh, his wife has a $12,000 car, and he has a $12,000 car. So he got $24,000 in cars. You can take about 20% of that uh, the first year, roughly speaking. Okay, so you're looking about what? What are you looking at? Forty-eight hundred dollars, right? Look at this guy. He's got almost. He's got ten thousand dollars to get right off because he's got a car. <laughs> are we having fun? Mm -hmm. See, if he doesn't have the business box, he can't deduct any of this. Now, this is what's never taught. When you go even to the HR block schools. They don't spend a lot of time on the schedule. See, they spend even less time on a 1040X where you go back and you amend the returns because they're, you get paid for just filling the forms out, filling the forms out, filling the forms out. All you get is 40 bucks a form or something, pop, pop, pop. If you spend any time to explain it, you lose money. The other guys in the room make more money. So the system is set up so anybody who explains this to you is severely penalized. Besides that, he doesn't want to do the audit. Well, what else have we got? We've got your uh, meals outside the house. Breakfast, lunch, dinners, theaters, entertainment. Okay? You wouldn't leave the house anymore if it wasn't for business, would you? Do this. See? You couldn't. You, matter of fact, you couldn't. You're in business all the time, aren't you? So your meals outside the house, breakfast, lunch, dinners, theaters, entertainment, golfing, bowling, recreation, all this stuff is, inter, is uh, somehow related to your business. You have to keep records. Next module will show records. But the expense here is very interesting because let's assume that you and your spouse each spend uh, $15 a day outside the house. Pretty minimal, right? Okay, so that's thirty dollars a day times three sixty five is about ten thousand dollars. Now you can take eighty percent of this because they cut back to twenty percent. I'll show you they they gave it actually on uh, things like depreciation and the, what they call the, the item seventy four where you can expense certain things. They so where they where they take it away from business, they also give it back. What they do is they take it away from the individual. See? Okay, so entertainment uh, would be uh, eight thousand dollars because you ate food outside. Well, you could also write off if food inside the house were used for your business. That would be right off. Well, everything you're doing, everybody's over there seeing you. You have people over for dinner. Okay, would it be reasonable to assume that 25% of your groceries are consumed by others while they're over at your house? Do this. Okay, now, what, what are you doing while others are over at your house? Well, you're eating with them, aren't you? So another 25% of your groceries are consumed by you while others are over there. Well, this brings us to the result that 50% of your groceries are used in the conduct of business. You have to keep records. We'll go through that, okay? Now, let's assume your grocery bill is $150 a week, okay, times 52, we're looking at about $7,500. Half of that, okay, about $3,700 or so is deduction, we'll call it demonstrations and training or sales promotion, whatever you want to call it, is deductible because you ate food at home. Now, come on, fess up. Some of you have been doing this all along, haven't you? Okay, now, now what you haven't been doing is deducting it. See, never am I suggesting that you spend more money. Well, you can't. You spend it all, right? <laughs> so you can't spend more money. You just reclassify what you are spending. Is this fun? See, people often ask me, they say, what does it cost to go to your seminar? I say, well, it's, it's usually free or, you know, a few bucks, but it costs you, like, uh, you know, 10000 a year to miss it. <laughs> okay? 
All right, then what do you got? Well, travel. Okay, anything more than 50 miles from home is business travel. Uh, it reminds me of one of our clients last fall. He and his wife, uh, uh, they ran an ad in the Honolulu Inquirer and one no, and, and, and to see if anyone wanted to be in their business. And then they flew over and they, he said they waited for two weeks to see if anyone would answer the ad. Okay, and he came back and he was, he was very disappointed. He said it didn't go too well and so they had to also go again this spring. Okay, now, and so, so we had uh, $3,000 here, okay. Okay, well, the guy was trying, you know, profit motive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm just reading the book, profit motive, okay. All right, that's what it says. Okay, now, we had one fellow also that wrote off a, uh, a mobile security unit one year, we found out because it barked and ate dog food. Okay, and so if you, if you, wanna, if you have cats, you may want to have them apply to your business as sort of a, you know, rodent control devices, or if you're into birds, you may want to go for aerial surveillance, okay? And so, so, okay, so we add these things up here, and you see with just a half a dozen things, we got what, four, we got 16, we got 24, you know, about 25,000 things right here. Do you think with another 190 items, we could get to 30, 39,000? If you've got any problems, if you've got money left over, you can't, you can't figure out what to do, call us, we'll help, okay? Now, see, so what we're talking about is that like this isn't really difficult. You're already doing it. If you, you know, it's just that now you have to have a business and deduct the items, okay? Now, we talked about record keeping. Yes, you have to show that you actually spent these things for the process claimed, okay? Let's go through record keeping real quickly here. It doesn't have to be too complete, just to give you an idea where we're going, okay? This is not for any specific use. This is a general application of these expenses. Each person will have his own you know, specialties. Okay, this is getting harder. <laughs> okay. All right, now. Let's take a look at some things, okay? Your profit motive, okay, you want to, remember we showed profit motive and we had economic activity, right? Okay, now these are the ways in which you spend your money, is that correct? Now, profit motive, economic activity is gonna show up as how you spend what? How you spend your money, right? So this is your money, is that right? And profit motive means that everything you do all the time is for business, so this is gonna be your time, isn't it? So here's how you spend your time. So you're gonna keep track of two things now, money and time. Now, you will not have to spend more than three or four minutes a day on this. this will, Four minutes a day will be max. If, if after a month or so you work on this, you find that you're spending more than four minutes a day, give us a call and we'll give you therapy, okay? <laughs> because it won't be a bookkeeping problem, it'll be a mental problem, okay? Now, so what, what we wanna show here is that anybody really, if he wants to, can do this. It's, not, it's really not that hard. Okay, now, we have here, uh, okay, what kinds of type, well, what do we got, some car, what's that? What is it? Oh yeah, I want you to pass them out. Anybody that would like to know how to do this, we'll give you a call. And if you don't like to, if you, if you don't want us to call you, don't give us a card. It's real simple, okay? And then that way nobody's called or bothered. Because if you want to pay tax, <laughs> we don't want to bother you, okay? Now, <laughs> but seriously, if you give us a card, we'll give you a call. And I'll come down here from time to time. And Guy will probably be working with us in some things here. And we'll, uh, we'll take care of your needs if you like. Okay, as far as showing you how you do this. Our first, our first visit is free. It will just give you a free estimate, what, what we can save for you and what it would cost. And you can either do it or not do it, okay? It's up to you. No obligation, no commitment. Okay, what kinds now, what kinds of time would you have? Well, let's take a look. We know that there's personal time and we know that there's business time, isn't that right? Now, based on our discussion here today, how much of your time in the future do you think would be related to personal use? None, okay? So notice carefully, you will have no personal time. Notice how this clears this whole story up for us now. Not complicated, you only have one kind of time, it's business, isn't it? Okay, what kinds of money are there? Well, there's only three ways I know of you can spend money, okay? One is with, with checks, one is with credit cards, and one is with cash. That's the only way you can spend money, isn't that interesting? So there's the kinds of time and money we have. I and mean, you can spend years studying this. It's called bookkeeping. You know, save your time. Okay, what do we have here? Okay, the next thing would be the records. What kind of records do you have to have? Well, to show your time, you want to have what's called a daily diary. 
Okay? Now, the daily diary is going to show the things that you, the, the people you see during the day, the people you talk to on the day, on the, every day, and the things you do every day. So your daily diary is going to show see, phone, and do, because that's the only three things there are to do every day. And this isn't like infinite. It's not a big problem. We just have to categorize these things and put something down, okay? All right, now, for records, what do we need? Well, for records, okay, we've got our canceled checks. We need our, I've got our canceled credit cards. Okay, what else do we need? Well, we need to have over here, uh, we need to have really sort of a cash log, don't we? We have a cash log, and the cash log is going to keep track of all your cash because you're already keeping track of everything else. So you're already doing a lot of it. It's just not maybe complete. Okay, now the next question here is what kinds of entries do we need to make? Okay, the entries that we need to make, by the way, the cash log, I can show you what that looks like. We, we, we produce those. See, here's my daily diary like this. Daily diary yesterday, daily diary day before. See, I'm in a business all the time, no problem. Ta -da, ta -da. Okay, now here's our cash log. And here's the categories, and here's all the stuff you put down. Put the receipts in here, we'll explain how to do all this. If you have a trust, you may not even have to file a personal tax return because the trust will file a return, and you may just work for expense reimbursements. In other words, the trust just reimburses your expenses. See? In other words, if you, if you go out and you spend money on behalf of this trust for food, shelter, clothing, travel, and so forth, the trust reimburses you the expenses. That's not income. Expense reimbursement is not income. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. So you may only work for a dollar a year. You just have your expenses reimbursed. <laughs> what do you want money for? That's just a problem. See? Now, the trust will have to file the return, but that takes the problem off you because now, you don't, you, you don't have to make any money if you don't make more than you know, a few dollars. You don't have to file a return, do you? Is this fun? You just disappeared, see? You know, you know Sun Tzu, another interesting book, two interesting books that you've got to read. One is The Prince by Machiavelli, okay? And the other is The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Marvelous book. He talks about how you win. He, it's a 2,500-year-old book written, what is it, sometime before Christ, okay? And, and uh, he says that it, when the enemy is more powerful than you are, your best strategy is to be not seen. <laughs> you, can't, you can't beat his logic. <laughs> I remember one time when I was drafted, back in the early, middle 50s, and we ended up at Fort Ord, and we had a big old black drill sergeant that came out, 4 o'clock in the morning, standing out there in the misty rain under the flight. And he says, I've been in this army 27 years. He says, every one of my buddies is dead, been shot by the enemy. And he says, there's only one reason I, I'm standing here. I remember this. I remember every word of it. It's 4 o'clock in the morning. You don't forget it. He says, it's because in 27 years of fighting, he says, the enemy never saw me. <laughs> he says, young troopers, we have 16 short weeks to learn this. Because that's the only thing that's going to keep you alive. And I thought, wow, that is really interesting. The way you stay alive is that the enemy doesn't see you. Well, if you don't have a tax return, what's he going to see? <laughs> Are we having fun yet? Okay. Why fight over a tax return when you don't have to have one? Let the trust do it. It makes you not seen. It's invisibility. It's your cover. Yes, sir. Who wrote the print? Uh, Machiavelli. Niccolo Machiavelli. 1412. About the Art of War. Art of War Sun Tzu. S-U-N-T-Z-U. -U. 15, what is it? Uh, 500 years B.C. Best military strategy ever written. Marvelous book. Everybody that is, goes into the CIA has to read that book before they take their first class. It's a primer. Because he's the father of military intelligence. He says, if you know your strength and you know your troops, you will win 50% of your battles. He says, if you know your strength and your troops and you know the enemy's strength and his troops, you will win 100% of your battles. Fascinating stuff. I mean, really, you can't beat it. When the enemy is bigger and more powerful than you are, the best strategy is invisibility. Don't be seen. It's not as hard as it sounds. Don't file a return. <laughs> now, if you've got a job, okay. And the guy's got another program, this untaxed thing. That's not what we're doing. we got a sort of a moderate or moderation of that, or I should say a modification of that, okay? And... Uh, you know, there's a lot of ways to skin the cat. If you don't like one program, you might like the other. You know, it's a free country. We don't have a monopoly on anything. Okay, you may even like somebody else's plan. 
You know, just all we're doing is giving you the necessary information so that my grandkids don't live in slavery. That's why I'm here. Okay. And the, the only thing that's going to protect them is you. <laughs> okay, because if you live in slavery, then it's going to be harder for them to get out of it. Okay, and we don't want to pass the system on to them, do we? Okay, entries. Okay, as far as your time is concerned, uh, okay, you want to put down the name of the person that you're with, the relationship that that person has to your business, and the reason why you had that meeting, sales, promotion, you know, consulting, whatever. And we'll go through this and we'll explain. As a matter of fact, we'll even give you a three-month supply of record-keeping materials absolutely free when we see you and show you how to do all this. No cost. If you don't want to come in, don't, don't come in. You can keep the records anyway. Okay, as far as the entries now over here are concerned, you want to put down the date that the money was spent, the amount of money that was spent, who the money was paid to, the uh, category that it was paid in, and the receipt. You always want to get a receipt. No matter what, the receipt is the, is the thing that proves that you had the expense, okay? So you may even, uh, well, I found that if you go out of the shopping centers at night, there's usually some laying out there, okay? And you can, and what this does is that it improves the ecology. It actually helps the place if you pick these up, okay? And uh, if you have a difficulty with this, we even have a client in Burbank who has a multi-level receipt business. So, uh, you know, not, not, to, not to worry, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, this isn't like really serious stuff. <laughs> oh, goodness, it's hard to do a serious tax seminar. But I mean, hey, you know, the point is, if you spend all your money, just keep the receipt. Okay? If you, 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 nothing can be disallowed, you've got the receipt for it, don't you? Okay, that's the time and the money. Okay, the next question would be, let's see how much time have we got here. Uh, let me just go through quickly then, I think probably some, some aspects of law which, which you might enjoy. Uh, what we want to show is, do you remember uh, we said that there was the law? Okay, so we have what's called, uh, we'll call this uh, common law, because common law is the law that's made by common people, whereas in, in a law that's made by an emperor is imperial law. That's the definition of it, okay? So under common law, we have a very interesting thing that takes place in this country. Under common law, okay, you have a uh, series of things that take place, I should point out. You've got the law that's actually made by the legislative branch of our government and signed by the president, don't you? The executive branch of our government. Okay, and I guess I really don't need that top line to go clear across there. I'll make it like this. Okay, now, you have, uh, after a law is made, it's, it's made into what we call a code. There's military codes, insurance codes, tax codes, all this. That's done by legislative analysts within the legislature, okay? And then, if you don't like this, you can go to court. And you can maybe have a, ju a judge hear it in a judicial case, or you may even want to request a jury. So you can get a jury trial. Okay, so this is the way our law works. This is set up by the Constitution. Uh, because that's, you know, that's what we learn, eighth grade civics class, that's what we learn, right? Common law. The problem is only 5% of the people when it comes to taxes are, 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 are ever participate in this. The reason is that it costs you uh, somewhere around $250,000 to complete this process, okay? And so not that many people want to spend that kind of money on their tax. If you're talking about actually going to a civil case, getting a jury trial, so forth and so on, you're talking mega bucks. Okay. So what people do is that they opt for uh, what we call imperial law. Okay, an imperial law over here has an interesting thing. They have what's called a uh, interpretation. Remember that? Remember we had two things, the law and the interpretation of the law. Remember we had two things, money and a note. The old, the old America had money, the new America has notes. The old America had law, the new America has interpretations. See, think, you know, two Americas, okay? Now, what do we have here? We have a, uh, uh, a regulation. The new law is a regulation. The, the interpretation, I'm sorry, is a regulation. And if you don't like the regulation, you can have a hearing. That's called an audit or an appeal. It certainly sounds fair, doesn't it? Okay, until we look at it a little more closely. 
And we find, if we look at it closely, that, for example, the interpretation was made by IRS. And then we take a look at the regulation, and we see that the regulation was written by IRS. And then we go to the hearing, and we find, oh, the hearing is conducted by IRS. <laughs> and this is a surprise now. The next part, you won't expect at all. The IRS usually decides that its interpretation was correct. <laughs> and what do they say in the cartoons? That, 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 that's all, folks. <laughs> the only way you can change that is to go here. You got an extra 250000 just kicking around? No problem. <laughs> or you can go to a little court that they design here called tax court, which is really a supposedly a legislative court, which is not a judicial court either. There's no jury. Remember King Charles got his head cut off? No jury. Star Chamber Court, that's what tax court is. Okay, not too problem. See, these problems have all been solved. And when you take history, you realize they've been solved. That's why you can't have the history. <laughs> oh, boy. All right, so what happens here? Well, you go down here to your tax preparer or whatever it is, and he doesn't tell you all this, does he? Isn't that interesting? And uh, because what? He has four problems. He's got four big problems down here, this tax preparer, doesn't he? Number one, he has to be trained, and he's trained by the IRS toady HR block. <laughs> and then, uh, then he has to be okay. He has to be able to, to do these taxes. So he has to, in the state of California, he has to be, he has to be you know, what they call licensed, or he has to have a number. Okay, and that can be revoked so that he can't do them anymore. And then, and then his review is, he's, 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 uh, uh, he's audited by these guys maybe, you see, or whatever. And not only that, but uh, he gets all the information from these guys and so forth. I mean, there's just a lot of things here. Okay, and he can be put out of business anytime the IRS wants to put him out of business. They just audit all of his clients. That's simple. You don't go back to that guy next year, do you? <laughs> Solves that problem. And they can put these guys out of business anytime. They want this guy has his, this is, this is George Orwell with the guy's face with the hobnail boot right on top of it. Okay, and uh, this guy now, he does the, the thing he's supposed to do. He collects money for his master because his master is the one that decides whether he can do this next year. You don't decide that. IRS does. And if he doesn't collect enough, he's got some problems. So he wants to make sure he collects a lot. Besides, he doesn't have much time to help you anyway. He's too busy, right? <laughs> okay, see, in the old days, in, in Jesus' time, they, they had people who were tax collectors and they called them publicans. And uh, they were considered hated. They were considered uh, uh, traitors by their, by their fellow neighbors, you remember? And they, because they would take money from their neighbors and give it to the, the enemy, the hated occupying Roman army. And, of course, today these people are called Republicans. So anyway, so as we go along, we find, we find that, okay, if we're waiting for someone else to solve this problem, we'll wait a long time, won't we? Because nobody's going to solve this problem for you. But you can solve it for yourself. Got it? The control is inside. I hope, I guess hope, that if there's anything you remember tonight, that you're in control. Because the, with the information, you're in control. The IRS is second fiddle compared to your power. This is important to remember, okay? Now, so what you're doing now is that you have to maybe take this guy to court. Now, there was a case like this up in Morgan Hill, California. Oh, a few years ago, there was a dentist that did for years and years and years had a business that lost money. So the IRS came and visited him. Could you tell us something about this business? He said, yes, I'd be glad to. He says, come and I'll even show it to you. So he went out behind the house into a barn. And he said, see this horse? And they said, yeah. He said, that's my business. And they said, that's your business? And he said, yeah. He says, actually, it was a ter terrible thing happened. He said, 14 years ago, I bought two horses, and I was going to raise and breed horses. But he said, a terrible thing happened. He said, the first year, my stud died. And he said, I had all this money wrapped up in this, this, this big breeding horse, and he died. And so meanwhile, I've got this mare on my hands. I'm trying to save enough money to buy another breeder. And I just, you know, I haven't got it yet. So meanwhile, I'm writing off all of the food, shelter, land, and everything for this horse. And they said, well, we have this little regulation that says if you don't make a profit in three out of five years, then that's a hobby. And he said, gentlemen, he says, I don't understand. This couldn't possibly be a hobby. And they said, why not? And he said, because I hate horses. <laughs> and, uh, and so they said, well, no, we're not going to buy that one. And so they disallowed his horses as a hobby. Well, he ends up taking it to the Supreme Court in 1981. Okay, he took it to the Supreme Court. It appears in the front page of the Wall Street Journal, finally, because he'd already gone to the IRS audits, three of them, he'd already gone through tax court, he'd already gone through federal district court, already gone to courts of appeals, see? This guy kept losing, 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 see? And uh, finally he gets up to the Supreme Court. And then the Supreme Court said, well, it would not be reasonable to assume that a man for 14 years would get up every morning and shovel manure for a hobby. <laughs> and 
So since there was some work involved, therefore it wasn't a hobby, it was a business. And whether he made any money or not is not incidental because they went by the law. Notice they didn't go by the interpretation. See, the Supreme Court doesn't sit there and cogitate over the interpretation. As far as they're concerned, that doesn't exist because it really doesn't. It only exists in your mind. It's a mind trip. It's psychological warfare. That interpretation really isn't there. See, isn't this fun? Okay, now, because you're going to go here. Now, and so they asked, this, so the Wall Street Journal, they interviewed this guy, says, God, how come you spent $250,000 on this horse? He says, well, he said, I wouldn't have done it, except I'd written off 650000 on expenses. <laughs> 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 well, all right. <laughs> You see, so it was profitable to him. But you see, that was an article you could put in the paper because that was a safe article. Because Joe Lunchbucket isn't going to go down and do this. So they could print it, you see. If Joe was going to do it, then that doesn't show up. So it was kind of everybody in Wall Street had a good chuckle. The guys in the bank had a chuckle. The guys in the IRS probably had a good chuckle. Because he's the only guy doing it. <laughs> but, see, you can do it too. Okay, now, 95% of the people down here, okay, are following this, this system, and it isn't even a law. It's just that they're conned into it. This is America 2. This is America 1. Get the picture? There's different people. There's different businesses. There's different laws. There's different forms. It's a different world. It's a different country. Which one do you want to work in? See? Now, so what, what we have now is a situation that would take you, just like a corporation, all the way through this. We got our ideas... Because we do the same thing for you that a tax department does for a corporation. Okay? Let me show you how this works. We work with different companies, different places, different times. We don't just work with one uh, thing. I'm just a tax consultant. I just consult with you, and I can refer you here, and I can refer you there, you know, if you really want to do these things, okay? But what you're getting with me is just simply the consulting, the information that will empower you to, to do this. But you still have to do it. I can't do anything if you don't. If you don't have the records, we can't win the audit. Or, you know, come out with a, what we call a check back audit. We don't just like to do audits, we like to get a check back. In other words, whatever tax you paid in prayer years, we get that back. <laughs> <laughs> we like to be very expensive when we go through to IRS. Okay. All right, so what we have here, let's say this is you, and you've got an income of about, uh, what do we say, $50,000 a year. So here's your income of $50,000 a year. Okay, and uh, which translates to $4,000 a month. Okay, that's a year. Okay, now, your tax on that, your tax loss, I'm going to call it loss, is about $1,000 a month. That's, that's the average person's tax loss on a $50,000 a year income, as we discussed, okay? Now... What we do is we put that into some other categories for you here, okay? The cost, and we put cost in parentheses because it quotes because it's only going to be a portion of what we save you, is 5%. So 5% of your $4,000 here is going to be $200 a month. In this particular case, it would cost you $200 a month to solve this problem. We, in turn, have some various things here that we will be glad to show you. There is the consulting fee, and there is the support. The support runs $50 a month, and this is this guy was saying is, is an organization called United Sovereigns. The consulting fee we're working with here would be $150 because that's the remainder here, and that's the fee of us telling you what to do and how to do it and helping you, showing you how to do it, okay? Now, so there's your fees, $200. What have you gained? Well, you've gained $800, see? You've gained $800 a month, and the cost is only a fraction of what you saved, Hey, what a deal. See, this is not bad, is it? Now, the consulting firms we work with, we work with one organization. It's called Temple Trust. And the reason it was called Temple Trust is because when we started it, when they, when they start, when started, we went into the Bible, and we thought, now, what would really be a safe name? So we read in Revelation 15:8 that the temple was, smoke, was filled with the smoke of the glory of God, and no man was able to enter. And we thought, aha, we'll have that one. We thought maybe smoking temple a bit much. Okay, now, so we, we just called it Temple Trust, but... You see, it's, it's almost like we, we, we wanted it to sound kind of religious because people regard income tax as a religion. They regard it as some kind of a sin tax. Okay? And they think that if they don't pay it, then they're sinful. <laughs> but, I mean, people really have this thing. It's like a lock-on, you know? That, oh, you go down, you pay this tax, and then you're absolved of all your guilt. 
see? Because you go down the street now and you tell the average guy, well, I'm not going to pay any more income tax, and he's going to say, um, <laughs> shame on you, see? And so he's not going to quite know what you're guilty of, but he's been triggered to think that you are guilty somehow. Well, okay, so that's our story. So that's basically how we would pay for it. Okay, uh, if you want me to, I can go into some of the multi-level on the United Sovereigns, or we can break. You, you want to do another three minutes? Okay, we'll do another. Let me, we even set it up so that if you do the United Sovereigns program, it's a business. <laughs> So if you don't have a business now, you've got one, okay? Or you can get one, you know. Or if you've got another one, this is just something that doesn't take any time. You can add to it, and it's easier to take the deductions if you have a couple businesses, okay? Let me just show you quickly how this works. This is, now, you see, not everybody understands business. And for that reason, I'm just going to conclude with this little story that really shows, you know, how the ladies really kind of understand business more than men uh, because they got, it's like, what, 82% of all the money out there is owned by ladies. But anyway, uh, which shows you men are really smarter. Okay, now, and so we have... Uh, well, this young lady was walking along the forest one day, and she uh, was walking along the path, and she encountered a frog. And so instead of jumping the way, the frog spoke to her and, and said, kiss me, I'm a prince. And this gal says, you're kidding. Now, she'd always heard these talking prince stories, talking frog stories, but she'd never seen one. So she picked up the frog, put it in her purse, and went on through the forest. Well, about an hour later, this frog is croaking away, and he said, why don't you kiss me? He says, if you kiss me, I'll turn into a handsome prince. And this gal looks down at her purse, and she says, are you kidding? She says, handsome princes or a dime a dozen? She said, I could make a million off a talking frog. Well, okay, so what we have, you see, is some people can see a business and some people can't. <laughs> so uh, I guess uh, if you have questions, uh, we'll go ahead and take them and then they'll be on the tape or it won't. But I do want to thank you for coming by tonight, for today. It was really nice, and uh, God bless, and keep the money in the country.